Okay, we are now live. All right. Welcome to the afternoon session of the Landmarks Preservation Commission's public hearing of December 7th, 2021. We will be resuming our public hearing agenda with item number four. This meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to watch the proceedings, you may do so by going to our YouTube channel. And if you would like to testify on any of the items, you may join the meeting at the estimated time for that item as shown on our agenda, which can be found on our website. And I'll turn it over to Corey Harala to take us through the afternoon session. Thank you, Sarah. And we'll begin with public hearing item number four, LPC 21-09698, an application for a certificate of appropriateness number of Manhattan block one, lot 10. This concerns multiple buildings on Governor's Islands, buildings four through eight, 10 and 11, and 14 through 20, part of Nolan Park in the Governor's Island Historic District. Um, 14 Victor Victorian Colonial Revival Italianate vernacular style officers quarters buildings uh, collectively built circa 1857 to 1902 and altered in the 20th century. Uh, the application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of windows. Hey commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys. Please unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you may begin. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Nicole DeFeo. Can you hear me? Um, I am the Senior Project Manager of Design and Construction at the Trust for Governors Island, um, and I will be presenting this master plan application with Mark Gardner from Jack Lich Gardner Architects. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Gardner, Jack Lutch Gardner Architects. Um, glad to be here, thank you. Um, so as was previously stated, we are looking uh, for a master plan application to substitute the windows in the Nolan Park Historic District on Governor's Island. Um, as you can see in the image to the right, um, Nolan Park is the area outlined in blue in the North Island Historic District that was historically used as private residences for officers in the U.S. Army and Coast Guard. Um, there is a total of 17 individual buildings that were constructed starting from the, 19, from the 1840s through the early 1900s, 14 of which are wood framed with clapboard siding and front porches as seen in the photograph on the bottom left. Um, today, this Nolan Park campus is used as um, a center for seasonal cultural programming since the island has been open to the public in 2006. Um, we have about 30 arts, sciences, educational and environmental organizations that make use of the buildings um, for public exhibition spaces, for workshop spaces, um, and for research. Um, we issue an open call for organizations and residents um, every year, and we were able to serve over 100 artists during the pandemic last year. Um, looking ahead, we'd like to make, the Trust is committed to making Nolan Park a permanent cultural campus um, and activating the houses uh, for year-round tenancy. And so last year, we issued the first RFP for year-round tenants and identified um, some nonprofit tenants for building number nine and also for building 20. Um, in terms of where we are today, um, this application kind of was triggered by the renovation of the first uh, building in Nolan Park, building 20, which is pictured in the top left of the slide. Um, and this was the last time we, be we came before the commission was for modifications to building 20 to make the first floor accessible. So adding an ADA ramp and restoring the wraparound porch um, to the 1930s condition. And with the renovation of Building 20, we started to look at Nolan Park as a campus um, and what would be the most efficient and cost-effective way um, to maintain the buildings uh, given our, our staff um, and available resources. So I'll turn it over to Mark to go into the specifics of uh, the window master plan and material substitution. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so uh, we're here today to present the um, basically a, an overall summary of the window master plan um, has noted um, 
there are 14 buildings ranging in style between uh, colonial revival, um, Victorian and, and Italianate. Um, there are, we're talking about 642 uh, existing windows that um, my firm Jack Lynch Gardner actually for the trust did a survey um, uh, and drew up all of the, all the buildings, um, did a complete survey of all the windows, which um, we'll, we'll show in our presentation. Um, and so what we're looking for today is a replacement window that will allow for easier ongoing maintenance and increased durability due to the Marine Harbor conditions. Um, and so that, that's going to be the, um, basically is at the heart of, of this uh, master plan. Next slide. Uh, looking at the, we looked at the existing conditions, um, noting that um, restoration is not preferred option because um, the existing windows are all single pane and not energy efficient. Um, the existing windows are in very bad shape due to the corrosive environment um, and strong winds off the harbor. There's a lot of decay. Uh, the Coast Guard, uh, um, over its time there, actually um, used aluminum storm windows to actually protect um, the existing windows really as a Band-Aid, and, and a lot of those still remain um, intact and on those buildings today. Next slide. So uh, our application is um, looking at Nolan Park, the 14 buildings, but we also would note that um, there are aluminum windows um, on a number of the uh, buildings within the historic district of, the, of Governor's Island. Um, most recently approved were building 108, um, which is uh, the, actually the administrative building for the trust. Um, that was approved in 2018 and building 301, um, which was also approved with aluminum windows in 2019. Next slide. So we're looking at aluminum windows for improved energy performance. They would be double paned for less air infiltration, uh, durability, um, the cost efficiency, um, the layouts would be consistent, um, approach for replacement that would be applied across the Nolan Park District. Um, and the aluminum construction will be more resistant to um, the strong winds reducing draft in the existing buildings. Next slide. So as I noted before, building 108 uses the Graham 2200 series. Um, this, is, this is the building here that's actually the trust's uh, administrative office. Um, we have drawings of the um, existing aluminum window, which has the, the mutton mullion details um, section of those windows. These are the same types of windows that we're looking to um, use across the district. Next slide. And also um, the replacement window, the type A, as we surveyed uh, across the district, those make up about 70% uh, of the windows that we're talking about. And so we're looking at using the Graham series, um, which has been used extensively across the island. Next slide. So as you can see here, this is part of our, our within our survey, we, uh, noted the various types of windows um, across, as I said before, the type A makes up about actually about 70% of all the, the windows within the, the 642 count. Next slide. Uh, and then our type D and E, which is um, the also a type of window, the casement and the awning windows, which we're looking to, to use. And I'll show a drawing of that um, in a little bit. Next slide. So our, um, this is the main type of window that we're looking to replace. As you can see on the left, the existing six over six um, double hung wood window and our proposed six over six double hung aluminum window. Next slide. Um, we put this slide in for true divided light. It was raised in the community board meeting about a true divided light. Um, we had done investigations into that and noted that in the use of a true divided light over the simulated divided 
that it would be a much heavier window and require the muttons uh, emollients to be much larger. Um, also decreasing the glazed area, not really matching up against the existing windows. Next slide. Uh, and so you can see here our, our vertical uh, sections through the double hung. Um, our details um, match up fairly well with the, with the existing uh, windows. This is from that 2200 series by Graham. Next slide. And our, this is the horizontal of the plan section um, showing, showing the same, the, the glazed area um, that matches up pretty fairly well with, with the existing. Next slide. And our, our awning window type, um, uh, which on the left is the existing and, and the, uh, the proposed aluminum awning. And, our, excuse me, our uh, casement windows, the existing uh, wood and the existing steel casement windows um, shown to the left and center, um, our proposed aluminum casement window to the right. Um, we use this as a, just an example. We did survey all the buildings, but just to give a sort of quick summary, um, this is uh, building 19 and we're looking at the existing conditions, um, photo photography of the existing building. Next slide. The condition of some of the windows, the uh, missing glass, we do note a stained glass window in, in this building, building 19, as well as uh, I believe in building six, which I'll note later. Um, also showing some of the missing, missing muttons in the window. Next slide. So we surveyed and showed the existing conditions. Um, next slide. And with our proposed change, this special window I'm noting is the, uh, the stained glass window, which is in this building and in building six, which we would um, notice to remain and no work would be proposed on those windows until um, those, that, that, those projects are done. Great. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay. Uh, yes, I see one question, Commissioner Devonshire. Just accept the request to unmute. How old are the extant windows? Uh, they're they're arranged. Some of them uh, some of them are replaced probably in the fifties. Some of them are. Uh, Probably, uh, I think the major renovation of the district was in the 30s, um, but there was also some changes in the 50s as well as in the 80s and the early 90s. Okay, and, and what is the performance life of the, the proposed windows? Uh, the ones we're proposing? Yes. Yeah, uh, those should be able to hold up well for, um, believe, at least 20 to 30. Nice. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. I'm wondering if you uh, at all considered aluminum clad wood windows, which have a better profile than the um, aluminum would more resemble wood, but not have all the issues? We, we did look at the um, aluminum clad window. Um, the one by Graham actually has a similar um, profile on the exterior, um, uses a similar profile, but um, the uh, cost of those windows became sort of prohibited to, prohibitive to um, the scale that we're sort of talking about here. And are, but are you planning on phasing these in? 
over time? Yes, yes, it would be, it would be phased in over time. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? And just to be clear, I think I understood from the sections, the wood casings would, are being proposed to be maintained or replicated that's, in wood, correct? That's so correct. It would be really the sash frame that you would be looking at. Correct. Okay. All right. If there are no other questions, I think we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you and I'll turn, turn it over to Sasha Seeley to take Thank us you. through the testimony. Okay, so first I'll be calling on John Graham. John, you should be receiving a request from me. Okay, John, I see that you are in the meeting. I just need for you to unmute your mic and state your name for the record, please. You have three minutes. Good afternoon, commissioners. John Graham for the VSNY. We were very interested to see this proposal on today's schedule because these buildings are unusual in so many ways. They are part of a national historic landmark. They are designated New York City landmarks and they are among the very small number of protected residential buildings which the public can actually enter going right up onto the historic porches through the front doors and into the rooms. And once inside, they can experience what the original tenants experienced when they looked out of their windows across the lawns through to the harbor. They are also unusual because it seems that they are under the control or influence of a dizzying number of public and private entities. The National Park Service, the National Parks of New York Harbor Conservancy, the National Parks of New York Harbor, the Trust for Governor's Island and the Friends for Governor's Island. But unfortunately, among all these important entities, no one seems to understand the meaning of historic preservation. Commissioners, these are not enormous buildings like the Empire State Building, where the sheer bulk of the structure overwhelms individual details. They are not lavishly embellished buildings, where your eye keeps moving, drawn from one unique feature to another to another. They are very simple buildings. This means that each individual element is extremely important to their overall character and appearance. And because visitors have the intimate experience of entering these rooms and standing at these windows, none are more important than the windows. Creating a master plan allowing the installation of aluminum windows will have an enormous negative impact on Nolan Park and its buildings. It is appalling that all of the important entities involved with Governor's Island have let these windows deteriorate to such a degree, but it is not too late to reverse this condition. We urge you in the strongest possible way to require the applicants to create a new master plan to restore, preserve, or replicate the original wood sash and let the many visitors to Nolan Park actually experience why it is a National Historic Monument. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Okay, next I'll be calling on Historic District Council. You should have received a request from me. I see that you are in the meeting. All I need for you to do is unmute your mic, state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, my name is Kathy Brill and I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HGC is not convinced by this plan. We believe this project requires a more rigorous specification project process and suggests that LPC require the applicant to prepare mocked up versions of a typical window set on the two different building types, individual windows on the building, so that staff can take a detailed look at their articulation and be able to sign off on it. The window master plan for these historic houses is a big decision and needs to be looked at with care. As there is such an abundance of windows to attend to, using six over six as the uniform replacement may be inappropriate. The wide range of individuality seen across the windows on each building should be preserved. As for materiality, we believe that aluminum clad wood windows would have a more historically appropriate set of exterior profiles and details. When finalizing the design, we also request that the applicant pay attention to Mullion versus Munton detailing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, those are my signups. Let me just take a glance over at the attendees. And I do not see any more hands raised, so I will pass it back over to you, Chair Carol. Okay, thank you. And I want to just note for the record that we received a resolution from Community Board 
uh, one in, Manha in uh, Manhattan recommending denial of the windows, um, not based on the material per se, but the details and the true divided, the fact that they're not true divided lights. Okay, I'd like to turn back to the applicants and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. You know, both in terms of the, the details of the material, uh, the aluminum windows, as well as the idea of the variety of window types. Yeah, I, I would say the, um, in terms of the variety of window types, uh, we would, we would replicate the, um, the, the window, according, we surveyed windows according to size and type. I, I think it, six over six is uh, uh, what many of them are, but not what all of them are. Um, and those that we believe, are some of the awnings and casements, those that we believe aren't those would be replicated to what is shown in the, in the master plan to what we believe is the, the original, um, you know, uh, spacing and size of the window. Um, I would also note that the, uh, the profile that we looked at is, is the closest, the existing profile mutton is, um, is a five eighths um, with the trim and what we're using the proposed is, um, is very close in size as a seven eighths um, inch profile. Yes, thank you. Um, and also that the, you can see here, the dash lines show the, um, the relationship of each of the, the windows, the existing on the left and the proposed on the right um, to one another in terms of, um, you know, the area of, of glazing, um, what the frames look like. Um, and again, we would be, uh, the trim work would be um, all in wood, um, replicating the existing. Okay. Thank you. And so just to clarify the question about the configuration, I think you, you said that you were going to be matching the original six over sixes where you know they existed. And then for other window types, you are going to be doing a configuration you believe would have been in place there uh, given the, the proportions of the pane sizes. Yes, yes, that's what I meant. Thank you. Okay. So the intent is to match the historic configuration yes. as, as far as we can tell. Okay. Commissioners, any final questions? Okay, I'm just going to request to unmute all of you so we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. And I'll just note for the record that Commissioner Chen is recused on this item and has not been present for the, this uh, presentation. Commissioner Halford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So the hearing's closed and we'll begin our discussion. And, um, you know, the Nolan Park is this section of houses that has as was presented today and as many of you know from previous applications and your own visits out to the island. And the um, proposal is to develop a master plan for window replacement in the houses so that they can, as over time, efficiently replace the windows as they find users for the individual houses. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they're proposing aluminum, which would be set within openings with wood trim, and that wood trim would be maintained. So the sight lines would be of the sort of sash frame that we'd be looking at. So we'll begin that discussion. Commissioner Latfi, would you like to start this one? Sure. Of course, I am a huge, as you know, I'm a huge fan of window master class. <laughs> and, uh, commend. The applicant for doing one uh, so that there is going to be some uh, consistency uh, and uniformity with uh, what the wood windows are replaced with and uh, and there'll be more ease in terms of the replacement. Uh, you know we as a commission oftentimes uh, in the situation where there have been wood windows that have been deteriorated, 
we oftentimes approve aluminum clad wood windows because the profiles of these windows resemble very closely, more closely uh, the, the wood window profiles. And, and I feel like I, I would recommend that that's what's used here. And if this particular manufacturer doesn't have a profile that works well, then I, I think the applicant should look at some other window manufacturers. There are, there are many others that, that are good. I, I appreciate the, that the intent is to match what the original windows were in, in, in terms of um, their configurations and I wanna recommend that the applicant continues to work with staff on that as well. Okay, great. Commissioner Gustafson. I would have uh, preferred to hear Commissioner Devonshire's comments uh, first, but my um, un unless I hear um, other comments to the contrary, my preference is for uh, um, is for the uh, aluminum-clad wood, um, and uh, and and uh, I'll I will um, hold my final decision in abeyance until I hear about things like the longevity, et cetera, from our own experts. Okay. All right, and you know, the longevity I think is important, not necessarily a factor that we consider in terms of appropriateness, but certainly the details, appearance, and profiles uh, are. Commissioner Holford Smith? I think given the fact that these are small buildings, they're simple buildings, and you can get right up close to the windows, that it is important that the material be as close as possible to the original. So I don't think aluminum is appropriate, but I think of aluminum clad window, wood window could be. Um, I agree with testimony that they really should be doing mock-ups um, to see how the new window is gonna fit with the existing trim. Um, just look at sight lines and get the proportions down correctly. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Chapin. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that clearly the uh, um, aluminum, the uh, aluminum clad wood is is important here. Uh, I heard the applicants say that would be more expensive, which I'm sure it is. But the I guess the question is how much. And uh, I'd be interested in Commissioner Devonshire's remarks about that issue. Um, but I um, I think in general that you know. The, as other commissioners have said, because you are viewing these so close up, uh, that this aspect is very important in this particular case. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I too wait on bated breath for Michael's views, <laughs> um, but I'll go out on a limb and, and agree with everyone else that the aluminum clad are probably the best choice for a master plan. I'm kind of surprised that Graham windows, for goodness sakes, are cheaper than aluminum clad windows. I, I, I've always tried to spec Graham windows and been told that they are like uh, buying a, a Lamborghini SUV. It's, uh, it's kind of out of the range for most folks. But um, I think that the profiles of the wood windows are virtually in, indistinguishable. And I, I don't think that they need to do a mock-up. I, I trust the staff on monitoring them. Okay, great. And Mike, Commissioner Devonshire, we've all been waiting for you. <laughs> However, um, I'm, you know, we, oh, we, Michael, I, I think I can't hear you very well. Really, I'm. I'm. Okay, not, now now I can. Yeah. Um, fading in and out. We we many years ago did condition assessments of the Nolan Park buildings um i'm i'm very happy that they're they're putting together a master plan um i'm i'm unhappy when i hear someone say that the environmental conditions are what have caused the uh, deterioration of these windows what causes deterioration of windows is environmental conditions coupled with lack of maintenance so don't blame it on the environment and when someone tells me that aluminum windows are easier to maintain 
than wood windows, I would ask the question, which I didn't ask, um, how do you maintain them? Because most of what I've experienced in my lifetime is that you don't maintain them, you can't maintain them. If they're spring-loaded mechanisms, all you can do is throw them away and, and put new ones in. And so I know we're not supposed to talk about life cycles or performance or anything like that. So then let's talk about the aesthetics. I think John Graham's discussion about getting close to these windows is, is absolutely true. You can get close to them on the exterior and people do, and you can get close to them on the interior, which people do. Um, I'm curious to know if changing these original wood windows, which, which you know, the, the, this approach goes completely against the Secretary of the Interior standards. And I'm, I would be not very surprised if, if this district was taken off the National Register because of changes like this. And so what, what I would say is I would like to see a mock-up because I think that it's very important. Shadow profiles, Munton profiles, everything about these windows is extremely important. My first vote is to restore what can be restored, replicate in kind. My second vote would be for aluminum clad wood windows. Anything less than that, I can't approve. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm thinking what we could do, and I know that your first vote isn't for aluminum clad wood windows, but I think for others, um, unless they've been persuaded otherwise, maybe we could do an approval for an aluminum clad wood window and require a mock-up um, to be reviewed by staff. The approval would be contingent upon a mock-up. Um, so why don't we do that? Commissioner Lutfi, would you like to take make that motion with that modification and then we'll see where we are. Um, in the matter of docket 21-09698, 4-810-14-20, Nolan Park, Douglas Island Historic District. Victorian colonial revival Italian Asia style officers quarters buildings built in circa 1857 to 1902 and altered in the 20th century. The application is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of windows. I note that the building's style, scale, material, and detail are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Governor's Island Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications funding. That the existing wood windows are deteriorated and in a condition that warrants replacement. That the proposed aluminum windows will match the historic windows in terms of operation configura configuration and finish. That the proposed change in material from wood to metal will be largely imperceptible when seen from public thoroughfares that the establishment of a master plan will reinforce the architectural and historic character of the buildings and facilitate future applications for new windows. <clears throat> However, I find that the details of the proposed aluminum window lack the depth and profiles of the historic wood windows which were more successfully replicated by aluminum clad wood windows. Therefore, I recommend that the master plan be revised to require aluminum clad wood windows and that the applicant uh, do mock-ups, <coughs> work with staff to do mock-ups to ensure the profiles of these windows match the existing trim. You're on, you're on mute, Sarah. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? You're on mute, Commissioner Chapin. Second. Okay, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. She's gone, she's gone for the day. Uh, sorry about that. Um, Commissioner Chapin. Aye. 
Commissioner Chen. Oh, he's the recused. Commissioner Devonshire. Nay. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With six in favor and one opposed, the motion passes. Okay, thank you. So please continue <laughs> to work with the staff um, and we'll, we'll also notify commissioners when the mock-up is in place. Okay, we'll move on to public hearing item number five, LPC 22-02676, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 174, lot 28. 71 Franklin Street in the Tribeca East Historic District. This is an Italianate Second Empire style store and loft building built in 1859 to 61. And the application is to construct a rooftop addition, replace windows and alter the ground floor uh, infill and areaway. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. They now have control of the presentation. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Uh, my name is James Sexcorn, and I'm with uh, the Trek Collaborative. Um, so today I'm presenting uh, 71 Franklin, as Corey had said. Uh, this is a project that we had presented earlier in 2015, uh, but now we've gone back to revise the, the scope uh, of the project to be uh, much more conservative than we had uh, proposed in the past. Um, as Corey had said, this project is in the Tribeca East Historic District. Um, sorry, no. here are some, sorry. <laughs> some historic photos of the, um, uh, of the existing project in 1940. Um, you can see it's got uh, some haphazardly infilled windows at the storefront, but it does also have this cor uh, cornice, which currently does not exist. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we are doing a uh, uh, fairly extensive interior renovation uh, on the project, but we are also uh, proposing to do new storefront infill at the storefront. Uh, we are uh, also proposing to replace windows uh, with painted wood windows um, and to um, restore the facade and the cornice as, as necessary. And finally, we are uh, proposing to add a one-story addition on the rooftop uh, with a bulkhead just above. Uh, here is a um, view of the entire block a photo montage. And you can see that the block has already uh, some appurtenances that have been added to other buildings. Uh, this is our um, addition, uh, the one-story addition with the bulkhead, which is dwarfed somewhat by the uh, addition that was done at 361 uh, Broadway. Here, uh, the proposed or the existing facade, um, you can see we're demo demoing uh, the existing windows and the infill of the storefront, keeping the cast iron intact. Um, in our proposed, um, you can see the one-story rooftop addition with bulkhead, um, the window replacement, um, and the storefront modifications. Here are some uh, pictures of the existing condition. Um, as you can see, uh, there is a cast iron uh, column and a frieze uh, that currently exists without um, a cornice. There is also a, an existing fire escape, which unlike the previous um, proposal, we are keeping for egress. Here are some more details uh, of the existing condition. Uh, this happens to be the entry into the building, which was slightly recessed. However, we are pulling forward um, the uh, entry or that particular bay so that it's more or less flush with um, the area behind uh, the cast iron column storefront facade. There is an existing uh, grill uh, that we're keeping in the westernmost bay, and we're actually going to replicate that um, in the easternmost bay. And I'll show you that uh, in the storefront elevations. Um, this is a detail, uh, really, of the existing condition of the sidewalk vaults. 
And uh, to the left, uh, there are sidebar vaults with bullet glass that have been covered over with um, diamond plate. There is the center portion is just concrete sidewalk and or is also diamond plate. And we are proposing to remove part of the uh, sidewalk vault uh, to provide egress uh, and exit egress from the building. Uh, the other platforms are um, the actual bullet glass, but they're in quite um, bad condition, as you can see in these photos. So our proposal really is to cover all of the um, existing vaults that have the diamond plate and the existing vaults where the uh, bullet glass is exposed uh, with new diamond plate. Um, you can see in this image where we have sidewalk um, at our new residential entry, which again is pulled forward to be just behind the cast iron facade. And this is our egress, uh, our new egress door out of the building. Uh, there are two uh, above grade um, retail spaces and we are preserving those entries or we'll, we are uh, preserving the spaces as retail, uh, but obviously the infill will be um, re-envisioned all in painted uh, wood. Above the retail entries, we've got um, a grill uh, for mechanical purposes to provide fresh air to those retail spaces as we're required by code. Uh, there are really three different typologies. I'll, I'll just go back. So we've got uh, a bay, a window bay that is more for display. We've got an entry to a retail space, and we've got a residential entry or egress. Um, this is the easternmost bay, but um, it shows just a large uh, piece of storefront glass, and we are recreating uh, the grill that is found in the westernmost bay. Above this is just a clear story. The second typology is really the entrance to the residential building. Um, it has a secondary transom above um, to bring down the height of the uh, entry doors. The doors have an infill of rib glass. The third typology is the entrance to the retail spaces. Again, it has that transom to bring down the scale of the doors, but also the infill for uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, these are some details of the windows, which we're working with staff level to, um, to design. And here's a um, rendering of the storefront infill uh, with the cast iron. And as you can see, we are not replacing cornice that previously existed, um, and the fire escape is remaining. Here you can see uh, the new sidewalk infill at our egress door and our residential door. And here are the platforms that exist but are being clad with diamond plate uh, on both sides um, and entrance at the entrances to the retail spaces. Here are the infill grills. This is the original, and this one we're recreating to match the original. This is just another view. And um, above, um, as I mentioned, we are replacing the windows. Uh, they are being replaced with wood windows, painted wood windows. Um, and we are simplifying the windows because currently where there were um, fire escape, uh, where there was the fire escape, there's a three over three um, layout of the windows. And we are proposing to um, make all the windows two over two. The windows themselves, uh, whereas the originals are double hung, uh, we are proposing a simulated uh, a window that simulates the double hung, but is actually uh, the lower part is a casement window, a tilt and turn. And finally, above uh, the one story addition at the roof um, is now simply clad in brick on the front face and the rear face, and the side elevations are uh, will be in stucco. There is a large painted uh, steel frame that frames uh, windows and doors that lead on to a terrace. 
Um, you can see we have mechanical equipment on top of this one-story addition, as well as on top of the bulkhead, um, the mechanical bulkhead just above. The material um, is a thin brick. Um, and uh, as I said, the frame is a painted steel. We also have a cable and steel rail that is up at the parapet or just behind the parapet, the line of the parapet. There will be uh, planters as well on the terrace. This is just a detail showing uh, the brick facade and the metal frame uh, that encircles the, the windows and doors. And just another view of a rendering of what this looks like from. So here you can see uh, these are uh, photo montages that show our the model um, up against the mock-up. And there is some slight visibility uh, of the addition from the west as you're moving down uh, towards uh, Church Street, uh, Franklin. Um, again, you still see some of the addition and that's because the adjacent buildings to the west are lower in scale, um, but they do kind of blend in or they're dwarfed by a 91 Leonard, which is immediately behind, and also the two-story edition of 361 Broadway. Here, again, you do see, this is from uh, Franklin Place, the alley that's just across um, our building, but there is some slight visibility. And here is another view kind of moving further down. And at some point, uh, right before you reach Church Street, the um, addition disappears. This was just to show uh, the uh, proposal that we had earlier back in 2015, and it was uh, definitely more um, contemporary in Phil, and you know, we've chosen uh, to kind of pull back and be somewhat more conservative in, in our approach this time. Yeah. I, think I could go through the plans, but I think um, I guess <laughs> we have questions. Let me know. Okay. Can you maybe on this rendering show us how maybe toggle between this and your rendering just to show us the how the visibility compares to the proposal we already approved? Um, so it's actually quite the same. Um, we're really, we have very similar heights um, and the extents of the volume that was approved are identical. Um, it's just a different rendering. Um, again, whereas before what was previous, previously approved was a metal clad, perforated metal clad uh, volume. This is brick on the front and stucco on the side. Okay, but, so the, the volume hasn't changed or the amount of visibility, it, it's just the materials. Correct. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson. Um, so uh, to follow that up, the mm -hmm. height's the same. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. The, is, is, the, is the setback the same? From the, the setback front? is the same. Um, it's the 15 feet that uh, we had proposed originally in 2015. So the only difference between this and the original proposal, the 2015-16 proposal, is the materiality. Right, uh, for the rooftop. Um, but right, for the rooftop, that's right, for the rooftop, that's what I'm talking about, right. right. Okay, thank you. Jim, could you also uh, confirm that that is the case for the second level, the bulkhead level? I think the staff's understanding that there was a dimensional change there as well. There, there was always a bulkhead on the roof, um, and again, that height hasn't been modified. Um, um, but it, it, in these views, the bulkhead is so, it doesn't actually here, so you can kind of see uh, there is a slight um, you know, peak of it right here. Okay. All right. Any other questions, commissioners? 
Okay, I don't see any questions right now. Why don't we move to the public testimony? If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha Seeley to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So first I'm gonna start off with those who signed up. So I have Historic District Council. I have sent you a request. Okay, Historic District Council, see that you are in the meeting. Please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, this is Kathy Burrell speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts, Co Districts Council. HEC feels the proposal is generally well done. However, we take issue with the size and visibility of the proposed mechanical bulkhead, as well as the materials being proposed for the entryway. First, we find the mechanical bulkhead structure to be too large, too visible, and is oversized for its required functionality. Typically, these considerations of the bulkhead are exempt, but because this proposal is highly visible, adjustments should be made to reduce its visibility. Reductions to the floor, floor heights of the penthouse, and mechanical bulkhead, repositioning of the mechanical room within the bulkhead, are perhaps and perhaps shrinking the mechanical room in the mechanical bulkhead to its absolute minimum, we reduce the visibility of this portion of the building. A change in the mechanical bulkhead's cladding material might also help to cause it to blend into the roofscapes of adjacent buildings. Next, we are concerned with the elimination of the cast iron and glass bulkhead and sidewalk details from the entrance facade. We suggest the commission require restoration and replacement of the original sidewalk vault space with the applicant using new cast iron and hollow glass sidewalk with vault lights. Additionally, this line of iron and steel should be pulled across the full width of the sidewalk apron, diamond plate being appropriately used at the building's at grade entrance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, I'll be calling on Spencer Davidson. Spencer, I have requested you to rejoin the meeting as a panelist. Spencer, I see that you are in the meeting now. Please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. Turn on your camera if you wish. You have three minutes to speak. Sure, Spencer Davidson. Uh, I'm a resident of 91 Leonard Street, uh, the building directly to the south. Um, I've been a resident here for two years and I have several concerns uh, about the construction um, of this particular development. Uh, the first being is myself nor any of the prior community members had any knowledge of this proposal um, prior to the CB1 meeting in October. Um, there was no mock-up shown to us, no plans for additional floors, and no chance for the community to even object to this development prior to the LPC hearing today. Um, so that's a great concern. Um, further, uh, the construction of the bulkhead, which the historic district just touched on, uh, I can tell you looks directly at my bedroom window. It is the mock-up uh, is set to be quite obtrusive. Uh, I also walked the Franklin Street District as of today, looking at the Cornish floor lines. I'm definitely concerned that the size and development of the penthouse unit is visible from every aspect of the street, north, south, east, uh, virtually every particular part of that uh, is absolutely troubling. Um, Further, it is my understanding that the owner of this development has been the owner for several years. Um, it is a historic building and has been left dilapidated and unmaintained as evidenced by the picture shown, uh, whether it be the extensive graffiti lock pads on the door, falling cast iron, uh, it has clearly been neglected for some time. So most of the construction we are concerned will be speculative at best uh, with a drawn out construction timeframe. Um, words such as um, the, the, excuse me, uh, what's the right word here? Uh, sub simulated or uh, synthetic double hung windows are a great concern. Um, the parapets on the roof line can clearly be seen uh, from Franklin Place, as you had mentioned previously. Um, and in addition to that, uh, again, the overall development of the penthouse unit we feel it should be if allowed at all, should be significantly minimized uh, to blend in nicely with the remainder of the historic district. Um, I purchased in 91 lettered for a specific reason. Obviously, my building being directly adjacent to this was extremely 
uh, important. And so I do not feel that the plans submitted at this time uh, are reflective of the remainder of the neighborhood, nor fit in nicely with the community. Okay, thank you. All right, next, um, Ashley Reitman. Ashley, I'll be bringing you in. I see that you are now in the meeting, Ashley. I just ask you if you could please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. My name is Ashley Reitman. Um, I'm a resident of 91 Leonard as well, and I happen to serve on our board of managers of the building. I'm testifying in opposition of the project of 71 Franklin Street. My biggest points of frustration are regarding the owner's plans, the process that they've skirted, and the history of ownership. Regarding the plans themselves, as everyone here knows, this building is within the boundary of a historic district. Most additions in this district have been one single story of reasonable height, if approved at all. The owners have pointed out that the two-story addition that was approved at the adjacent corner building at 67th and Franklin, also known as a cast iron house. However, it is worth reiterating that, that that building is not included within the historic boundaries and that the addition is the exception and not the standard for the area, given the overwhelming amount of work that they did to restore that building at the time. Moreover, the proposed 20-foot addition is excessively tall, especially for just a single unit penthouse and looks like a monstrosity from the rear. I have photos I can share, but the gist is that the rest of the block is significantly shorter than the proposed addition. If you look at sl slide six of their presentation, the addition will be more than 20 feet, bringing the total height of the building to 96 feet, two inches tall. Plus, to the best of my understanding, the HAC units would sit on top of that, making the total height even taller. If you flip to slide five, you'll see that this would be much higher than any other mid-block building on the street except for 93 Fr Franklin, which is much closer to the corner of church and has an original taller building height and a much narrower addition. And I don't know if you could see this photo. It's a, uh, it's a little yeah, blurry. It's a, bit blurry yeah. it's a little blurry, sorry. I tried to uh, figure out a better way to, to, to show it, but I, I try to compare the addition that is proposed and that of um, 93 Franklin. And you could see that 93 Fr Franklin is significantly narrower and less obstructive than the proposed addition here at 71 Franklin Street. Anyway, my second point of frustration and perhaps the most upsetting is that we feel blindsided by the process they've gone through to even get to this point today. The owners did not have the requisite mock-up of the rooftop addition installed prior to presenting to Community Board 1 in October and set no information or notice to the surrounding buildings. As a result, its neighbors had zero knowledge of the project at the time of the meeting and therefore couldn't have voiced their concerns then. And honestly, CB1 technically shouldn't have even considered the project without the mock-up installed, yet they approved it based on photos from a prior mock-up done in 2014, which had different plans. It is very unfortunate that today has been our first and only opportunity to discuss this project publicly. And frankly, we are lucky to even have found out about this meeting in time, given the lack of transparency in the process thus far. Finally, the owner has owned this property for more than 20 years, and they have allowed this building to become vacant, dilapidated, and a health and safety hazard. It's ironic that the developer is showing photos of the poor condition of the building, since they are to blame for its deterioration over the past two decades. This developer has zero track record of maintaining the integrity of this building, nor continuing the necessary upkeep to uphold our city standards of a landmark building, and I seriously question their ability to do so in the future. In summary, I urge you to please consider the plans for 71 Franklin. Thank you. All right, um, next I'll be calling on Marina Vaynerman. Marina, you should be receiving a request for me to rejoin as a panelist so that you are able to unmute your mic and speak. Okay, Marina, I see that you have accepted my request. Please unmute your mic, turn on your camera if you wish. State your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Okay. I see, all right. I think Marina might be having some issues. Okay, so I will bring in next Juan P, Juan P. I will bring you in next so that you can go ahead and speak. Okay, Juan, I see that you are in the meeting. I just need for you to unmute your mic, please, and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hi there. Uh, my name is Juan Pellerano, and 
Uh, I'm a resident of the historic district of uh, Tribeca and a proud resident. Um, after reviewing, um, speaking, you know, reviewing the plans and hearing the proposal from the landlord, I just want to raise similar concerns to the previous two uh, residents of the community. I think while this in nature is more conservative, it's still ambitious given the state of the building under the ownership of this landlord over the last 20 or so years. As most mentioned, this is a building that's been left to waste in a historic community that is rich and proud tradition. Currently, it's occupied by um, rats and vagrants for the better part of the ownership of this landlord. And I think this is a very favorable representation of the existing condition, considering uh, the photos that were shown to the LPC commission today. I also have extreme concerns about the contemporary roof. This is something that, uh, as mentioned previously, the cast iron got rare approval for, but they are not within the zoned area of the historic district. And thus this is not really a precedent that can be set uh, for this addition. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Marina, if you are still in the meeting, please raise your hand again. I don't see, but I will call on you again if you are able to rejoin the meeting. Um, I do see I have a hand raised, Christabel Goff. I am sending you a request. Okay, I see that you are in the meeting now. Christabel Goff, all I need for you to do, please, is unmute your mic and state your name for the, um, for the record, please. You have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, this is Christabel Goff speaking for the Society for the Architecture of the City. Uh, throwing out surviving 19th century vault lights in front of an old landmark property is an economy practiced by investors who are looking not for history, but for easy conformity. But the historic district is supposed to be a special place and the historic sidewalk vaults and their vault lights were an innovation of their time indispensable to the character of Lower Manhattan's 19th century commercial historic districts. When these districts were newly designated decades ago, there were real problems of disinvestment and uncertainty about future prospects. Restoring vault lights damaged by years of neglect is expensive and decisions had to be made that would enable building restoration within a reasonable budget. Some will recall the larger policy decision here to preserve industrial character in sidewalk repairs by using diamond plate where vault lights were extremely damaged. More recently, the LPC has encouraged vault light restoration or replacement in kind. Perhaps decades ago, pioneers could not afford this, but today's investors and the increased property values make it possible to protect the 19th century vistas that are increasing their fortunes while creating unique tourist destinations that benefit all. In Tribeca, vault lights should preferably be restored or replaced, but never discarded. Uh, we chose to focus on the vault lights. However, there are numerous other problems with this application as you have successfully heard. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me take a glance back over. I do not see any more hands raised. So I will hand it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. And I'll just note for the record that we received a resolution from Manhattan Community Board one recommending approval of the uh, addition and the changes at the ground floor. Um, okay, let's turn to the applicants and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard today. Um, I, I did just want to say, though, that we, we aren't um, getting rid of the vault lights. We are merely covering them over with new diamond plate, uh, preserving the condition so that in the future, if the owner so chooses, he can replace the vault lights um, at a later date. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and commissioners, do we have any final questions? And I think, you know, just on the rooftop addition, just to, I think, to be clear, there is maybe one change, and that is at the bulkhead, you previously had a railing and you're now proposing a parapet. I think that's the staff's <laughs> understanding. So that's the, the one change to the volume. And I don't know if you want to go to the slide where you see that little bit of the top of the bulkhead. I don't know if I, oh, here we go. Uh, you can see it a little bit here. Um, it might be. Jim, do you know which slide you would like to show at this point? Um, you do see it in this slide, LPC 26. Um, there might be an earlier slide where it's closer. Um, so maybe if the, the slide that's just for this, uh, no, I think if LPC 26, the next slide is probably the clearest indication where you see the sliver of-, of That the, white line above the yes. more beige, sort of lighter beige above the darker. I think there are some other views that are more of a front on view that show this more clearly than these oblique, oblique angles, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this one is, again, it's a little bit kind of cut off in this view or, you know, everything is blending. So it's hard to, yeah. ah, here we go. This, this, yeah. Okay. So you, what you see is probably the parapet. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, let's close the hearing and move to our discussion. So commissioners look for my uh, request to unmute. Okay, and Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second, Sarah. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed. Um, and so what we're looking at today is a, a second proposal for this building with commission uh, previously approved a, a different uh, scheme uh, that included a rooftop addition of this size, um, the two differences of the size, location and volume. The two differences are that the, the bulkhead has a parapet as opposed to a railing and the materials are no longer metal. They're a white thin brick on the front and stucco on the side. And um, in the previous approval, the commission approved modern infill. Um, so the current proposal is for um, more sort of traditional looking doors and covering the vault lights. So we'll begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Gustafson, would you like to start this one? Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I guess let's start with the uh, the part that's most uh, the biggest piece of it. The uh, the, the rooftop addition. I you know based on the representations that I've heard today from the uh, applicant um, is 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 fine with me. Uh, there may be some um, issues about the. Um, uh, the materials that are used, but I'm but I'm uh, generally okay. Certainly okay with the bulk of the uh, rooftop addition. Um, the in terms of the um, the changes they're making to the windows, we uh, I applaud them for using wood windows and their attempt to make it um, uh, to to make them look as much as they can like uh, the existing, uh, even with the change in the um, in the function um, of the windows. Um, I, I I I'm. I, I would I would think they should work with staff to make sure the details on those windows uh, turn out to be um, um, as close as they represent that they will be to the existing. Um, the um, as far as the the, the vault lights are concerned, um, you know we are I think you know my in my few years of experience we do seem to be turning a corner here. Um, on in terms of our um, acceptance of the gen of the generalization that we can that they sh that they should simply be um, um, either removed or covered over, um, and um, and I'm not sure that we've seen enough here to tell me that these cannot be um, these cannot be restored. So I I'm not happy to uh, to have those um, uh, covered over. 
Um, and, and just to, if, if I could jump in on this, I mean, the covering is something that we have historically done to preserve them in place, but I, it, I think it has come to my attention from the staff that this wasn't at, as clearly represented, but that there is one section of vault light in front of the door that is being removed and replaced with concrete at the entrance. So just mm -hmm. to be clear about that. Um, Excuse me, can, can whoever's typing, please put themselves on mute. Or not, um, as the case may be. Um, I think that leaves me with the um, uh, with the infill, and um, and there again, I generally I'm okay with the uh, the change in the um, in the in the infill, um, but again, I think they need to really um, work through. I it, some of the representations I saw in this, I couldn't really see as much of the detail as I would have liked to. Um, so I, I certainly want them to work with staff to make sure that that all. Um, uh, works out well as well. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Commission well, Commissioner Jefferson, you came in, I think, during the testimony. I don't know if you saw enough of the presentation to feel comfortable commenting today. I, I think I did not see enough to feel comfortable. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Holford Smith. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, I guess I'll start with the addition, which I think is actually the easier uh, portion. Um, I'm generally uh, find an addition here to be appropriate. I do, looking at this section, they have very tall ceiling heights and overall, overall heights on this um, rooftop addition. But I think they could bring down and help reduce the um, visibility. And perhaps if they went back to a railing at the bulkhead, then that would eliminate that portion of it. Um, I think the stucco on the side is fine. Um, what they're showing in the rendering is that it's all just sort of tan, um, but I think that the other rendering um, of the front of the um, penthouse is showing this white brick, which I think they need to work on details of how, how, that, how that brick ends or how the stucco begins. Um, it's not going to look like the sort of tan box that they're showing here, um, but I think they can work with staff on that. Um, so I'd recommend them reducing the height of the, of the addition. I have quite a few concerns about the storefront. I feel like they have not drawn it um, adequately enough to understand um, what they're changing. They're, they're removing quite a lot of historic material, but I don't understand why they're removing. Um, they're removing apparently the, the ventilated transoms, the return panels that sort of appear like shutters, the side panels that also look like shutters. Um, looks like they're overall reducing the height of the transom. Um, I would recommend if at all possible, they keep that transom across all of the storefront. And if they can keep as much of the sort of shutter pattern, cast iron as possible. Um, you can see that on slide. Six. I understand that that doors are moving in and out, um, but their their sections are not clear, and it's really not the details of the drop under are very undeveloped. Mm -hmm. um, they're replicating that grill pattern, um, which exists on the, on the far because it's the far right of the building, um, which I think is a good detail to put on the other storefront on the left. Um, and they're showing, as you pointed out earlier, um, that they're removing the section of the vault lights in front of the, one of the entry doors that I think should remain. And I think that both sections of vault lights should be, uh, not be covered, but should remain and be restored. But I think, I think there's a lot here that I'd like to have them come back and, and show us more detail on. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I have to really agree completely with uh, Commissioner Holford Smith, you know, on the uh, her comments on the addition, the storefront, uh, and also on the vault lights. Um, and so that, I have nothing more to say on the issue because I agree with what she had to say. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Anne. I think that her observations were very uh, perceptive, and I, I agree with what she's saying. 
I, um, I think that the vault lights have to be, I, I, the photographs that I saw did not convince me that they were in a condition that merited removal or covering. Um, and certainly for the section at the entrance that uh, they want to remove them, if they, if they are going to be removing them, they should be relocated to a place where there are no vault lights. Um, and if there, if there are no such locations and they should stay where they are, uh, if that's acceptable to code. Um, I think that the uh, rooftop addition, uh, I agree with her in terms of the height. There's no, there's, it, it's easy to knock a foot off that thing and, and it'll be fine. Uh, you'll still have 11, nine foot interiors. I think that the change to a solid parapet was probably a bad move in terms of visibility and should be rethought. I think the use of thin brick is something that we at the commission tried, have in the past tried to discourage because it's a uh, relatively flimsy, uh, uh, oops, relatively flimsy uh, uh, approach. Uh, and I would, I would suggest also that if they're going to a more uh, traditional rooftop accretion uh, uh, background look, they consider uh, using a, a, a brick on the side uh, you know, a kind of a common brick on the side to extend it up. Uh, that's something that I've seen, we've, that I believe we've done in this district a number of times and districts like it. Um, it might be more uh, uh, beneficial in, in terms of obscuring the uh, height of the addition. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. I, I really don't have much to add beyond what Michael and Ann have said. Um, and I feel strongly about Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen. Likewise, yeah, I, I agree with Anne and, and what Michael Baldwin just said, uh, okay. I think, yeah. And Commissioner Lutfi. Yes, I I concur. I think they, that Anne and Baldwin covered everything. Okay. All right, great. So uh, we won't take any action today. I think that there is some support for uh, approving this addition again, if it's lowered a bit and the parapet on the bulkhead is returned to a railing and the materials are restudied uh, to, to read more as a rooftop, typical rooftop accretion. And um, that the ground floor, um, storefront details be further developed and that all efforts be made to preserve the uh, cast iron vault lights in place. And so when you are have a revised proposal and we can look at those further developed details, we will have you back again for a public meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll now move to public hearing item number six, LPC 22-01146. An application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 583, lot 52. Nine St. Luke's Place in the Greenwich Village Historic District. This is an Italianate style row house built in 1852. And the application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions and excavate the cellar and rear yard. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, I now have control over the presentation. Uh, you just need to click on your screen and then you can advance the slides using the arrow keys. Please unmute yourself and state your name for the record and you may begin. John Gabriel, you need to unmute yourself, please. Okay, well, you're still, you're still muted. We can't hear you. Great, right, now we can hear you. Please state your name for the record. You may begin. Oh, hi, this is John Gabriel Newcomb. I'm the principal at JG Newcomb Architecture. And as the core mentioned, I'm here to present our uh, restoration and uh, renovation in addition to nine St. Luke's Place. So Nine St. Luke's, as you all probably know, is uh, one of 15 uh, very, very similar buildings on the southernmost edge of the Greenwich Village uh, Historic District in, uh, in uh, Lower Manhattan, uh, West Village. 
And, you know, we have a lot of work that we have worked out with uh, the staff level. So our, our client is actually on the board, um, on the advisory council uh, for historic preservation. Obviously, we took this very seriously in terms of restoring this building. They bought it for the reason that it was uh, a really unique and special place. Um, so this is the existing tax lock photo that we have, and then some archival photos from NYPL. And I won't go through the history of it, but it's, uh, as you all probably know, it's, it's a very, very interesting block with, uh, you know, uh, Mayor uh, James Walker lived there, you know, at Trinity had de developed it, but obviously this is the park on the southern edge. Um, so next slide, which I seem not to be able to do. <laughs> there we go. Whoa. Sorry, very, very fussy. Okay. Uh, nope. I have a lot of hard, a very difficult time with controls on this. Sorry, I apologize. Okay. Good come. Okay. So uh, this is an overall uh, context of the building. Nice St. Louis is, is sort of in the middle of the 15. Um, the image below it shows the two main things that we would like to discuss today. One is the sort of rear extension uh, in context. So you see all of the pink uh, boxes are the extensions on, on the rest of the row houses, uh, the, the houses. Uh, the light blue boxes uh, refer to the second part of the presentation, which has to do with the bulkhead, which we would like to place on top, as well as a small study of the rear on the north side. Um, light blue refers to all of the uh, stair bulkheads on the block, and the dark blue is to all of the additions on the block. Uh, I'm just having a hell of a time controlling this. I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, nope. Would it be easier if I if I took over control and you tell me next slide? I think that would be great because I it's not letting my keyboard do it, which makes the mouse really really fussy. So yeah, if you don't mind, I would appreciate it. I apologize. I don't know. I don't know. I've uh, certainly done enough Zoom meetings. Um, okay, so the next slide shows uh, we commissioned a uh, number of uh, actually a fair amount of drone photography to, to take a look at the property. Nine St. Louis obviously is the one uh, that's you know center middle. That's dashed in red. Uh, adjacent to it, again, you, you'll see the, the number of uh, other additions and the rear extensions have been, have been, uh, have been built. Uh, next slide, please. The first part of what I'd like to discuss is the, the extension to the rear. So we are proposing, a, uh, in context, a relatively modest uh, five foot nine extension. Uh, the existing facade, uh, as beautiful as the front is and as much love and care as we're going to put into it, the rear is. Uh, oddly, a little bit more haphazard. Um, so, you know, one of the considerations was to create obviously a little bit more living space on the interior. Um, you know, obviously, we'd like to, uh, you know, repair through the extension all of the various cracks and, and structural issues that this has. Um, we're going to propose new uh, new steel and glass windows on the rear, and but maintaining the three windows at the top level as well as restoring the cornice at the top level to maintain uh, maintain the line that's uh, very, very very consistent on the on the uh, north side of these buildings. Uh, next, please. So this is uh, this really just shows the context of all of the different additions where it goes from. I want to say about 25 feet on number 15, which is pretty amazing. Uh, 12 comes out about 19. Um, our probably our, our spirit animal, our kind of closest guide was 11 St. Luke's, um, which we're pretty closely modeling our renovation on. It was more recent and had gone through the landmarks process. Um, it's coming out about six and a half feet. We're at five nine, um, so I, I think we're hopefully safely in in, in the ballpark. Um, and the next slide, please. Uh, this is an existing, uh, so existing photograph. So looking, uh, the top left image is looking at 12 St. Luke's, which again is a 19 foot edition, uh, fairly dramatic. Uh, the next image to the right there, the second from the left is uh, 11 St. Luke's, which again is pretty fairly close to what we're proposing. It's a little bit more, six and a half feet. And then ours in the middle and the red, and then on the far right, was the uh, David Chipperfield addition from or uh, renovation from a few years ago, which uh, does not come back, but which has um, 
So a very large uh, full light plate glass window on the parlor floor. Uh, next, please. This is an image of the rear yard. Uh, nothing, nothing too exciting to see here, um, but for context, next slide. Um, so this is the uh, existing and proposed elevations. So I was going to left existing proposed. We are extending the uh, from the garden level parlor floor and and uh, second floor. We're extending that out as I said, five foot nine. Uh, we're proposing a series of metal and glass windows. We actually had a, a very I would say a very, very productive and very helpful and collaborative interchange with staff over the past couple of months on, on developing this. Um, I actually really appreciated many of their comments. Um, used, even as of a couple of weeks ago, we, we actually had the brick on the parapet level go uh, all the way up and they made a I think really smart recommendation of lowering that and creating a guardrail. Uh, just was a lot of brick. Um, you know, we, on our first round, Actually, it's shown a very a much more modern square window on the second floor. Um, we had, we again the comment was maybe try to keep a little bit more in keeping with the windows above. So we created uh, double hung windows that were um, similar in uh, in scale to those, but but doubled up to relate to the floor belows. And I, I think all of these um, all the comments are actually really welcome. Um, it's actually it's a pleasure working with them, um, and obviously keeping the corners level. Um, uh, consistent and, uh, and, and just restoring what's there. Uh, next slide, slide, please. This is the exi existing section, um, and we can refer. This is really for reference. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the proposed section. So obviously, we you know owners would like to uh, dig down, uh, create a more expensive cellar, um, and then on the top you can see the roof bulkhead. Uh, the majority of it is the stair bulkhead on the left. Um, so again, in extensive uh, collaboration and consultation with the staff level, we, we actually came up with a plan, which I think was, I think, better for everyone. Our initial volume was about nine feet south. Um, it still wasn't significantly visible at the street level, but um, given the proximity, given the park across the street, uh, we felt it was a stronger designed to recess it further to the north. So we actually just shifted everything to the north uh, nine feet. Um, so that was a fairly big change. And I, I think that was for the best. Um, uh, other than that, you know, we were, I think there was a consideration to keep uh, a large proportion of the rear yard elevated. So we have a platform level at the, at the, at the northernmost part of the garden floor on the exterior. Uh, again, all these were, um, very helpful and uh, suggestions for this meeting, uh, which we really took into account. Um, next slide, please. So this is a rendering showing um, on the left, you can see 11 St. Luke's that's coming out six foot six. Uh, our addition is on the right, uh, five foot nine, We're roughly similar in context. Um, it shows the- I think we've lost your sound. Can you hear me now? We yes, can we can hear, hear you. you. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so I was just saying uh, 11 St. Louis is on the left. Nine, our project at nine is obviously the, the rendered one in the brick. Um, you can see the sort of lowered power cut level uh, again in consultation with uh, uh, staff level. And the facade being a fairly simple uh, steel and glass uh, series of, of spaces. The garden level and, and parlor floor actually have um, a double height space that's in the front, which is why we have it going full height. Uh, and again, the, the windows on the second floor are meant to be um, more in scale with the original building, but tracking the floors below with a, um, hopefully it's a hybrid that you'll appreciate. Um, next slide, please. And that's actually, that's it for, okay. So the next uh, next section is really about the penthouse edition. So the drone photo on the top shows, uh, obviously in bright red where our site is. And then we've sort of highlighted uh, to the east of that and, and uh, eight St. Louis to the west of the various editions. Um, I think from the street level, it looks, all of these editions look pretty terrible up here, <laughs> frankly, but at the street level, you know, they've been carefully planted mostly out of, out of view. Um, I think 11 is probably the exception and we'll, we'll sort of highlight 
um, sort of our, our project relative to 11. Um, and again, if we look at the plan diagram, uh, again, the light blue is the bulkhead and the dark blue is the, the, uh, the, the actual architect, you know, the addition part, uh, sort of studies or, 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 um, or rooms that are up there. So next slide, please. That's the same view from the rear. Um, I don't have too much more to add. I think it's the same same concept. Um, I mean, we're. I will say, compared to some of these other buildings, we are really being careful about hiding our mechanical. We actually made enormous efforts to just sort of locate that in areas that wouldn't even be public from the north. So I think on that, we're, we're probably doing a lot better than a lot of these. Um, but next slide, please. So this is the the upper plan is the roof. The lower plan is the penthouse level. Uh, again, sort of light blue shows the stair bulkhead portion and the dark blue shows the study. Uh, as I was just mentioning, you know, we, we located our main air handler in that little box called AC, uh, AC below, vent there. Um, everything that's on the rooftop uh, is all very low and it's not visible from the street, which is terrific. I think it's barely, I'm not, I'm not sure it's even visible from the park unless you have really good eyesight. Um, there are two, uh, two vents that are fairly low. A very small air conditioning unit just for the, that just uh, services the load for the penthouse and an ERV energy recovery unit there that's set back. Obviously, we made every effort to set everything as far back from the southern elevation as possible. Uh, we're also showing the six foot FDNY required path on the roof level. Um, other, other, other items of note are the, uh, the, the chimney extensions. Uh, so we're I'm actually, I'll be perfectly candid on, we're extending the bottom one there that you're circling um, is the neighbor of 10 St. Luke's. Um, they have not renovated the property. I'm pretty sure they will. Um, I, I don't know what it is that we're extending. So this is sort of the worst case situation. I'm hoping that it's, it's nothing or maybe just a little bit smaller. So that's worst case, but that's what we're planning for. And obviously we're, we have two flus coming out on the, uh, that, the, the uh, Western side to so the top of the plan, which we have actually offset at the penthouse level to set them back. I wanna say about two feet further North and, and that much less visible from the street. And we have um, uh, one flu that's in the bottom center of the plan, which is pretty much totally hidden. And then a couple of other flus from 10 St. Ten St. Luke's. Again, worst case, we, we don't actually know if they're active, but um, I'm just calling them out so you're aware of them. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else on here. I think that's about it. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the sight lines. So um, just to show that we're, you know, even from the furthest left, we're actually, you know, we're seeing a little bit of the um, head on, we're seeing a little bit of the fireplace um, extensions and really not seeing any of the uh, bulkhead extension. Um, I should point out the, the guardrail for FDNY, which you can see in the section at the very top, um, again, based on um, staff level's recommendations, which I agree with, was to keep as a stainless steel guardrail, or, you know, if, if it is visible, from far off, um, it'll hopefully blend into the sky being sort of silver metal color. Uh, and we, you know, I think initially we had a parapet you know, extending the uh, material, but I, I think that just made more sense. So next, please. Uh, these are the south and north elevations. So we're, uh, the chimney extensions, since uh, they're a little bit visible from the corners of the street, uh, we're proposing those in brick to match. Um, and then the infill we're proposing as a limestone uh, uh, panel system, uh, sort of the grooved limestone, um, sort of solid material. Uh, next, please. These are our, we have photographs, but we also did renderings showing um, the, the fireplace extensions in context. And obviously, you know, from the block, um, and these are tagged ABC from the, in front of the building to the left, to the right, um, you really can't see the, uh, the addition. Uh, next, please. And then we have the mock-up. Um, I apologize for the verdure. It's quite green. This is always a little bit challenging, um, but I think, you know, from the block, so if we look at the plan below A, B, C, D, these are the sort of block level um, uh, views. Uh, none of the bulkhead or, or uh, roof addition are visible. Um, I did want to point out 11. Um, so obviously ours is in green, 11, uh, ours is in orange, 11 is in green. 
um, which is uh, significantly a lot more visible than ours, which I was a bit surprised at. And then if we go to the next slide, um, similar. So this is really from inside the park. Um, we have photos from the other side of the park, but I mean, you just can't see anything. It's just um, it's just too green. And frankly, I, I'd say even in, even in the winter, there are just so many branches. I mean, there's a density of trees. Um, if you were to see anything, that means all the trees would have died, which I think you've got some bigger problems at that point. Um, but this shows, you know, it's, you can see the orange um, from across, um, really mostly the, the fireplace blues, and we're highlighting um, 11 as, as, a, as a sort of um, comparison, which is, is a lot, is pretty visible. Uh, I think there's some maybe slightly better photos next. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, this is a little bit closer up. So this is from the little playground. Um, so there you can see a little bit further, again, occluded mostly by the trees. Um, and, and, you know, obviously long-term our strategy is to, to have plantings that will even reduce this. Um, we, we have some planters up at the front of the building to, uh, to hide that as much as possible, but that's, um, that's what we have. Um, next, I don't know if that's the last, oh, oh yeah, sorry, yes. Um, so these are just renderings of the, of the addition. So we're really, again, showing all of the duct work. This is fully coordinated. Um, you know, again, trying to keep everything as, as low as humanly possible. Um, and again, we did move this back nine feet, which was a pretty significant move from the first iteration, um, but all for the best. Um, next, please. That's the elevation of the south. Um, next, please. The, uh, and that's the, uh, the rendering looking at it from the north. So that's the rear of the building on the, on the garden side. And next one, please, should be the elevation of the northern facade. And next one is the materials uh, which we're proposing. So really brick to match, um, you know, we're calling out Belden, I'm not sure, you know, I think we're, we're working with staff to make sure that we have a, a very close match. Uh, we're obviously with Rob to match. Um, you know, like I said, I, I, the, the client is on a, a National Historic Preservation Board, so we're, we are, we're going to be fairly serious about the, uh, the window restoration, the, the, the areaway, the brick, all of those things. Um, we're replacing a lot of old air conditioner units, the, the, a lot of the, um, a lot of the old trim, a lot of the brownstone around the windows is really in terrible condition. So we're, we're doing all of that, but obviously we don't need to go through that because that, that's going to be on the staff level. I think we've, uh, we've worked all of that out. And that's it. Uh, the only the last images are really about the floor plans, just for reference. Um, we can go through them or, or pause here. Up to you. I think we can pause here. Thank you. And let's see, commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions at this time. So we'll move to public testimony and we may have questions after that. So um, if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And as always, we'll start with anyone who signed up in advance. And I will turn it over to Sasha to take us through the testimony. Thank you. Okay, so first um, I'm going to reach out to Anna Markham. Anna, you should receive a request from me to rejoin as a panelist. All right, Anna, please just state your name for the record. I'm gonna unmute your mic. Um, you have three minutes to speak. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Anna Markham, and I am the Director of Research and Preservation for Village Preservation. I am speaking on behalf of the organization today. Village Preservation does not believe the proposed alterations to nine St. Luke's Place should be approved. This is one of the most cohesive and visually striking blocks in the Greenwich Village Historic District and all of New York City. The proposed rooftop addition, while slightly improved from the iteration shown to the Community Board 2 Landmarks and Public Aesthetics Committee, still overwhelms the roof line from the public right of way view shed. The excessive number of chimneys on the building is the most visually problematic feature of this penthouse addition. Typically, these homes have just two chimneys. The light colored finish of the additional chimneys um, only draws more attention to their visibility from the public right of way. Considering how remarkably intact this home is, the addition is far too visually prominent and should be substantially reduced in size. The alterations to the rear facade of the building are also excessive. Before the basement and parlor floors can be 
can be expanded, we must also be assured that the structure of the building can withstand the trauma of all of this excavation and alteration. In light of the Department of Buildings order for demolition of nine landmarked 1840s row houses at 4454 9th Avenue and 35155 West 14th, we must pay careful attention to how construction work on one building can impact that structure and all structures connected to that building and possibly destabilize a block of historic homes. We echo Community Board 2's assertion that the rear basement windows and parlor floor windows can only be approved if the parlor floor configuration makes some reference to the three original historic punched windows. We also recommend that the expansion of the building through the rear facade be limited to just the basement and parlor floor levels to retain more of the historic fabric of the floors above. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next I have Historic District Council. All right, you should be in the meeting now, Historic District Council. Please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, this is Kathy Brill speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HGC asks that the commission require construction of a two-story full width extension only and disallow the proposed second story extension. We believe the maintenance of the upper two floors of a typical row house to be more elegant and allows for a more light-filled garden environment. We would also note that there is no compelling reason to add space to the third floor as that floor already has sufficient area to accommodate the program. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and let's see, we have one more. German Feldman. All right, I see you. I have requested you, username Feldman, to rejoin as a panelist. All right, I just need for you to please unmute your mic, um, state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Jeremy, I see that you are, in fact, in the meeting. I just need for you to unmute your mic. Yeah, I think I just got it. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Gary Feldman. I work for Dear Pillow. We're the ones who design supportive excavation for nine cent loop place. And um, what they can say is that everything that we did was um, to satisfy New York City DOB requirement. Everything was designed according to all the safety and all the safety protocols of New York City, it satisfies all the codes. And it's done as per every standard practice for excavation of this type. We don't believe that uh, anything unsafe, what we propose, I mean, actually is there. Everything that we propose basically is according to the New York City um, standards including the monitoring of the structures uh, during the excavation procedures. We think we have an uh, extensive monitoring program of all the landmark buildings within 90 feet radius around the zone of excavation. And um, all of it kind of it goes in line with New York City requirement. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I do not see any more hands raised, Chair Carroll. So. I can pass it back over to you. Okay, thank you. And I will note for the record that we received a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 2 recommending approval of the entrance, provided the detailing is a careful historic design, um, and that the penthouse be reduced in size and or moved toward the rear of the building to reduce visibility. Approval of the rear basement windows and parlor floor windows provided the configuration makes some re reference to, oh, I think this is at the rear facade, reference to the three punched windows they replace. And approval of the excavation work provided all care is taken. And then they recommend denial of the chimney design um, and that the chimney be replaced with a more traditional design that be positioned in the historic parallel to the property line in the historic, I think they meant historic position parallel to the property line and flat against the sides of the building as close to the rear of the building as possible. Um, so essentially recommending approval provided the details are correct and that the, um, uh, and that and deny approval of most of the work providing the windows are correct, the details are correct and um, 
that the new rear facade have three punched openings and recommend denial of the chimneys. So a little bit of a long resolution. Okay, let, uh, let me turn back to the applicants. We do have some questions, um, but I'd just like to ask the applicants first if they'd like to respond to the testimony. Uh, yes, a uh, couple of things. First of all, uh, in terms of the uh, recommendation from CD from the community board, um, we've done all, of, I think most of that, um, absent the, the, the second floor windows on the rear. We have lowered the, the extent, we have lowered the extension on the roof. We have set it back nine feet. Uh, again, that was, this design is following that meeting and extensive uh, landmark staff consultation and, and collaboration. Um, the chimneys uh, were originally uh, not brick to match. They are now brick to match, and I think that's great. Um, we're actually going, um, one thing I didn't present, uh, we're actually going a little bit further with the chimney caps. It's really a black steel plate and a perfor uh, you know, sort of a, a metal perforated um, collar to hide the mechanical portions of the chimneys. Um, so I think we, we went even a little bit further than what the recommendation was in, in my mind. Um, so I, I feel like, uh, and, and, and also actually the other thing is, uh, another, I forgot to mention one other, uh, staff level recommendation, which we also took was to break up the volume to, into two, to sort of further reduce the sort of the monolithic quali uh, quality of it. Um, we, yeah, I think that's about it. I think you heard from our engineer, um, obviously, I mean, just to say we've had, we've done numerous similar projects uh, so far none of them have fallen knock on wood um, i think we have an extraordinary team of engineers consultants and i think we have a pretty solid track record with extremely complex projects of this nature so i'm uh, cautiously optimistic we will be okay but yes okay. understood commissioner goldblum just a question for staff uh are there other visible chimneys on the block Corey. Sorry, my computer is being very glitchy. I'm not sure if you can hear me or see me. We can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, it, it does appear that uh, two houses down, you can see a portion of uh, a chain. Okay, we just lost, lost you, Corey. He so muted himself, <laughs> it's weird. It seems that maybe if we can go to the slide that shows the view from the park, um, I think you, there are some chimneys that are visible two houses down. Maybe the applicants can show us that. Yeah, I don't see any. Uh, this one, if you go to 11, uh, you just skipped it. Um, 11 St. Louis is visible. And I, I don't know that we researched everything else. Okay. Mm. But it's hard to tell. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Chapin. Yes, on slide 20, um, which is shows the visibility, can the applicant just uh, outline exactly with a pointer or something? What's I can see that there are chimneys. Are there some other elements that are visible uh, from the front? So from, from this view, I think you'll see the top of the addition um, again. I, uh, excuse me, but I'm I'm interested in the front view. Thank you. I, the one the slide before that, I guess it is. Okay. Maybe I, I gave you the wrong number. Excuse me. Nineteen. That's okay. Um, I think you'll see. I, I had a, I actually I took yeah. these photos. There you go. Yeah, from the street. No, you can't. On the street side, you can see absolutely nothing. Again, that was a that was a. I think even when it was nine feet north, you could see like. I think it was about roughly four inches of the roof. Obviously setting it back nine feet really significantly diminished it. 
So, at, you know, view C is the one on the second from the right. It's, it's, it's accurate. Okay, so from the street, you see the chimneys. From within the park, you will see the addition itself in conjunction with the chimneys, um, but you also see the addition on 11 St. Luke's, and do you see others in the row as well? I know there you are a lot of all, them. Yeah, all, all of them. They're all visible, unfortunately. I mean, that's unfortunate. Okay. Um, yeah. Again, if you look, and if you look at our, if you look at our, our roof plan, you'll know that we're the furthest back. We really, again, we really made an effort um, as, as much as we can to, to move this thing back. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson. Just accept the request to unmute. Am I hearing correctly? That the other penthouses can be seen from the park? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, all of them, yeah. Okay, so yes, because the park, if you can get back so far, you can see above the roof line in the entire row and you can see all of the additions. And yours is set back more than most. Is it, how does it compare in height to the others? Uh, I think it's comparable to almost all of them. I believe one of the slides has a rough estimate. Again, we can't go up there and measure them, but we, we actually took that into account. Um, I, I think it's comparable. Um, okay. All right. Other questions, commissioners? All right, I'm gonna to start to request to unmute you so that we can move to our discussion. All right, and Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so, um, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. We have um, an application that is very similar to one that we approved two doors away at 11 St. Luke's um, in terms of its height and depth of its proposed rear yard addition. And, um, and then it also included a rooftop addition and excavation. And, um, and we just had a discussion about how this rooftop addition compares to the others in the row in terms of its height and setback. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you start this one? Sure. Um, this is a good slide to, to look at. I, I think seeing it with the other recently approved addition um, makes me feel that the three-story addition is appropriate. I might have... I may have felt better with a two-story addition, but at looking at the one that we just approved recently, I think we like that. This, this is very comparable to that. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, the design of the rear facade is, um, is fine and in keeping with what we, what we typically um, approve for rear additions. Um, and I think that the, the size of the Rooftop bulkhead um, seems to be pretty minimal, okay, so I think it's it's okay. I'm understanding that you can't see it unless you're in the park. Um, I guess one thing that I would like them to try to do is to minimize the chimney visibility. And I wonder if it could be a combination of offsetting the flues and perhaps bringing the brick down so you're not raising the entire brick chimney up, which is a big mass, but keep the brick low and then just have the flues project. Maybe they could be offset so that they're not as visible. Um, I think that those are probably most of my comments. I think it's pretty much appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin? Yeah, I, I agree with those comments. I, I think that this, uh, addition uh, is comparable in uh, size and, you know, presentation really uh, to the one that was previously approved. If anything, there's somewhat less, um, you know, uh, uh, glass space. Um, 
it's a little odd then that it's a five, four, three rhythm rather than the three rhythms, but you know, it's not, I don't, I might prefer, you know, three at windows on the uh, upper floor, but I, it's not something I'm going to, I would reject it for. Uh, and uh, the only little, in the, uh, you know, penthouse, I think they moved it back. They have it uh, down enough. It's not visible. That's okay. Except from the park, which everything is visible from. And uh, I think that the, um, I, the comment, the suggestion Commissioner Holford Smith just made about uh, the chimneys is a good way to perhaps reduce their visibility. And I would definitely like to see that reduced, but other than that, I really don't have any uh, real problems with this application. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Yeah, I agree with uh, what Ann said. And the only um, suggestion that I would add to that with is the little brick uh, parapet wall at the back here. I think when we've seen that in the past, I thought it was more successfully done <laughs> where it was chamfered or clad in a way that suggests that it was really part of the roof and not extension of the wall. Uh, that will that will help hold that very consistent top line of this very distinctive row. Uh, otherwise, uh, as as Ann said, uh, th those those amendments are good suggestions, but it's generally an appropriate scheme. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Devonshire. I I agree with Ann as well. I and I I specifically agree with the idea about lowering the brick and uh, having exposed flues, which is something we all over New York. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I agree as well uh, with Anne and, and what Commissioner Devonshire just said. Okay, and Commissioner Lutfi. I, you know, on the rear facade, I also would have preferred if the uh, three windows had been retained uh, on the back, but. Uh, this is consistent with what was approved, so I, I could approve it. I also agree that uh, with Anne's recommendations uh, on uh, making the, the chimneys less visible from the front. And uh, the, the, uh, because all of these additions are visible, um, and this is uh, from a distance, um, uh, the only other thing I would bring up is whether or not the applicant should look at the materiality that's used on the addition to see if they can, they can use something that's more traditionally used um, on, on additions that we normally approve and, and those in, in this area that are also visible. Okay. Commissioner Jefferson? I, I agree with Anne's comments. They're on point. Okay, and Commissioner Gustafson? Um, I, I agree I agree with Anne as well. Um, I think it is appropriate. Uh, part of the basis for that, however, is, this, is the representation that when you look at this from the park, uh, that all of these rooftop extensions, um, additions, sorry, are, uh, are visible. Um, I would, um, I guess my, um, I would prefer in the future if the staff would require applicants to uh, provide a rendering without the trees there, particularly when that point of view is crucial. Um, many applicants do provide that for us. Um, and it's easy to do with the, our computer uh, generation these days. Um, and if we're going to rely on it, I'm right now relying on staff's agreement that, uh, that all of them are visible. That's a, a good point. And I think that when we are looking at um, the main point of visibility, we should have a view with the trees photoshopped out. Um, okay. All right. So I think we have a consensus to approve this um, with and recommendations for reducing the visibility of the chimneys. And, um, and I think we should look at the, uh, the suggestion for the parapet at the rear facade as well. Uh, just sort of re restudy that parapet to maintain the, the cornice line of the rear facades. So Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make that motion? Yes. In the matter of OPC 22011469, 9, St. Luke's Place in the Greenwich Village Historic District. An Italian style row house built in 1852 
Application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions and excavate the cellar and rear yard. I note that the building's scale, style, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. I recommend approval with some modifications, finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features of the building, that the proposed rooftop addition will be set back from the front and rear facades, and therefore the work will retain a sense of the building's original scale and massing, that the proposed rooftop addition and railings will only be visible over the front facade when viewed from a distance within an open recreation field like from Clarkson Street at the opposite side of the park, and will be seen in the context of the other rooftop accretions on this block. That the simple fenestration and neutral stucco finish of the proposed rooftop addition will help it to blend with the background and is in keeping with the materials found in other rooftop additions along this rail. That the chimney extensions will be the minimum height required by building code. That the proposed work of the rear yard will not be visible from any public thoroughfare. That the proposed rear yard addition will project minimally into the rear yard and will not significantly diminish the block's central green space that the proposed rear yard addition will not rise to the full height of the building and that the top floor of the existing rear facade will be retained. That the materials and details of the rear addition, rear yard addition, featuring brick cladding, metal window assemblies, and punched masonry openings at the top floor of the addition will be in keeping with rear yard extensions found within this block and throughout the district. That the proposed excavation for a below grade addition will be conducted in compliance with the Department of Buildings regulations under the supervision of a licensed professional engineer to protect the building's facades and the adjacent buildings. All right, there sorry, I got distracted by the typing <laughs> that I was hearing in the background. Uh, uh, okay, um, Commissioner uh, Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. I didn't finish reading it. But. Oh, sorry. I didn't think that was the end. <laughs> oh. But when you stopped, I thought, oh. No, I saw that you muted me, so I stopped. Um. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was okay. trying to mute the typing. The sorry about good. that. Please go ahead. That's right. <laughs> I think I'm here. Uh, and that a green space will be maintained <laughs> on top of the excavated area, and that the excavation will end at least five feet short of the lot line to preserve planting green space. However, I find that the proposed new chimneys will be highly visible of the primary facade when viewed from across the street outside the looks place and will detract from the streetscape. Therefore, I recommend that um, the applicant um, work with staff to reduce the height of the brick cladding of the chimneys and extend only the flues as necessary to the minimum height and perhaps they can offset them as well to reduce visibility. And at the rear facade of the addition, the small brick parapet be studied to be more in keeping with a rooftop addition and uh, not a brick wall. Thank you. Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Uh, I changed my mind, no. <laughs> <laughs> I. Okay. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved with those modifications. Please continue to work with the staff and we'll move to the next item. Caroline, can you take us through the next item? All right, let, I'll do it myself. Okay, the next item is gonna be item public hearing item number eight. It's docket number LPC 21-02301-363 Lafayette Street in the NoHo Historic District, in the borough of Manhattan, block 530, lot 7509. And this is an application for a certificate of appropriateness. Um, this is a building designed by Morris Ajme Architects and built in 2017 to 2019 with an extant remnant of a party wall at 20 Bond Street. And this is an application to establish a master plan governing the future installation of painted wall signs. 
Okay, hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing and the staff will take you through the presentation. Good afternoon, commissioners. Dina Tasklinger, preservation staff. The application before you is 363 Lafayette Street, which is located between Bond and Great Jones Streets in the NoHo Historic District ex Extension. The proposal is to establish a master plan governing the future installation of painted wall signs. I will present the details of the proposal. Commissioners will note that 363 Lafayette Street was built between 2017 and 2019 pursuant to a C of A, and that the proposed sign space is on a remnant historic party wall facing Lafayette Street on this portion here, um, and that this party wall is physically attached to 20 Bond Street, but owned by 363 Lafayette ownership and is located above a one-story portion of their building. And this is that one-story portion there with the wall above. Um, the proposed sign will be set back three feet from the primary Crosby Street facade, and it will occupy approximately 11% of the visible wall. And as is standard, the applicants are requesting a 10-year master plan, during which time they will apply for an authorization to proceed for each copy change to be reviewed by staff. As you can see in the 1926 photograph, this facade historically did feature signage and various wall treatments. Um, as always, the applicants colossal, colossal media do hand paint their signs and follow historical methods. Here are examples of historic painted wall signs in the NoHo Historic District and Extension and their locations. And then this is an example of another approved master plan along Lafayette Street and its location relative to the current proposal. Uh, but note that no other commission approved signs will be seen in conjunction with the sign before you today. Uh, Colossal Media is proposing that there be no regulations on content permitted within the approved sign area. Each iteration of the sign will include a four inch solid black or white border and there will be a vendor plaque of a set size located outside the sign at the bottom right corner, uh, consistent with other painted wall sign approvals throughout this and neighboring districts. The following are just several examples of signs approved by staff under similar master plans with the same content regulations. And now I'll just return to the slide showing the proposed conditions and the applicant is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we do have a question, Commissioner Goldblum. So why are we proposing a, a horizontal sign when it looks like what was there before was a, a, a vertical sign in the area of that tar, no? And how does the substrate condition varying, how's that gonna be addressed? Are you gonna take away the tar or um, barge it over or something? Uh, my name is Jonathan Harris from Colossal Media, and uh, the reason we are proposing a, a horizontal formatted sign space is that it is limited to the wall that extends past 20 Bond Street's lot line into 363 Lafayette's ownership. And in the current condition photos, you can see that that is limited in height to the proposed area. Uh, the black tar or uh, blocking was from an unapproved uh, vinyl sign in the early 2000s and is left over as backing from that era. And are you going to remove it off of your part of the wall? Uh, we, if, if it's paint, we were going to paint over it, which okay. I believe, I believe it is just black paint okay if, okay if it's just black paint but we should we'll also investigate if that vinyl sign has, was installed in violation the backup would presumably be part of it and that would have to be corrected in order to correct the violation so we'll look into that as well okay thanks okay other I, questions sorry did you want to say something else Yes, I, I don't believe that's part of 363 Lafayette's tax lot. I believe that's 20 Bond Street's tax lot above mm -hmm. party wall. So yeah. um, I would look there. Right, we, it, exactly. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll investigate it looking at the 20 Bond Street property. 
Okay. I don't see any other questions at this time. So we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Sasha to take us through the testimony. Okay, thank you. So I do have one sign up from Historic District Council. So I am requesting you to rejoin the meeting as a panelist. All right, Kathy, you should be all set. Please just state your name for the record. Um, you have three minutes to speak. Hold on. I think, hold on. Um, all right, hold on. I am requesting you again, HDC. Hey, uh, sorry, I apologize. I actually um, accidentally um requested to testify but we don't have a testimony for this one all righty no worries all right then um i have no signups and i don't see any hands raised if that's the case then all right okay. here carol okay thank you so we, we do have a resolution from manhattan community board to recommending approval of the application provided that the sign be shorter in height to provide space between the windows above and the top of the sign Okay, would you like to respond to the community board's comments? I don't know if that issue came up while you were at the community board. Uh, we talked about it briefly, but we are set down six inches from the, the window above, and I believe a similar amount from the window below. And also to remember that the wall that this proposal is on is set out from the windows on 20 Bond Street's lot line, uh, four inches as well. So, okay. um, so it's not in the same plane. Exactly. Okay, Commissioner Holford Smith. That was um, pretty much my question was going to be for staff whether we had a minimum distance that we keep the painted signs from a window. We really haven't established that. Okay, I, it helps that it's not in the same plane. Okay, great. Any other final questions? Okay, I am sending requests to unmute all of you so that we can move to close the hearing. All right, and Commissioner Goldblum, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, this is uh, an application very similar to all of the other master plans that we have been approving recently and meets all of those criteria. Um, it's unique in that it's on a, a party wall that belongs to an adjacent property um, in a different plane than the, the, the side wall of the building it sits in front of and um, otherwise meets our criteria. So Commissioner Chen, would you like to start this one? Yeah, I, I think this is very appropriate. Um, and uh, other than its uh, unique characteristics of the site uh, topography, um, uh, this is what we normally approve. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi? Seems appropriate. Commissioner Jefferson? Appropriate. Commissioner Gustafson? Appropriate. Commissioner Holford Smith? Agreed. Commissioner Chapin? I agree. Commissioner Goldblum? Agreed. And Commissioner Devonshire? Appropriate. Okay. That's a unanimous uh, support for this project. So, Commissioner Chen, would you be able to make the motion? No problem. Thanks. In the matter of LPC, 21-2301-363 Lafayette Street, NoHo Historic District. The application is to establish a master plan for the future installation of painted wall signs. Uh, noting the 363 Lafayette Street was constructed in 2017 and 2019 pursuant to a certificate of appropriateness and that the proposed work will occur above a one-story portion of the new building on a remnant built historic party wall which is attached to 20 Barn Street, a building whose style, scale, materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special character of the historic district. I recommend 
approval finding that the painted application of the signage will be in keeping with the traditional application methods and commercial character of historic painted wall signs, which are a traditional form of signage in this historic district, that the sign will be located at, a, at an undeveloped secondary elevation and will be pulled back from the primary facade by three feet. And therefore, the sign will not detract from any significant architectural features of the building or adjacent building. That the proposed master plan will permit a painted non illuminated yeah. wall sign that covers approximately 11% of the visible <coughs> wall surface, a, a coverage percentage just consistent with prior commission approvals. That the combination of the placement and size of the sign will help it maintain a subordinate presence at the building and within the streetscape regardless of the type of graphics or number of colors used within the body of the sign that the sign will include a solid painted border a typical feature of historic wall signs that the vendor tag will have a set location and size that the proposed master plan will be valid for a period of 10 years and the applicant will document every sign approved under the master plan so there will be a record the commission can consider when reviewing the effectiveness of the master plan criteria. Thank you. Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All right. And Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Just Aye. Un Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devinger. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Ludfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, so that is approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item, Caroline. Commissioners, the next item is item number nine, docket number 22-02764 an application for a certificate of appropriateness at 860 Broadway, also known as 27 to 29 East 17th Street and 32 to 34 East 18th Street in the Ladies Mile Historic District, Borough of Manhattan, Block 846, Lot 26, a late 19th century commercial style store building designed by Detlef Linau and built in 1883 to 84 and altered and refaced by F.H. Dewey and Company in 1925. The application is to construct rooftop additions, raise the parapet, and install railings. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. They now have control of the presentation. Um, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Robert Bianco with PKSB Architects, uh, representing the owners of 860 Broadway in the Ladies Mile Historic District. The building is located at the corner of East 17th Street and Broadway and fronts onto Union Square. And the building is also located on a through lot with frontage to 18th Street. Uh, stated, originally built in 1884, the 1940 tax photo and 1980s tax photo show that the, build, the existing building remains largely unchanged since that 1924, uh, 1925 facade replacement. Um, some of you may remember <laughs> many years ago, we came forward with a uh, application for a highly visible two-story rooftop addition at this building. Um, we thought that it would be helpful just to quickly show a couple of images. Staff, staff also thought it would be helpful to show images of that previous approval to sort of set a context for what we're, we're currently presenting today. Um, and to be clear, this is not the proposal that is on, on the table today, um, but this two-story mansard roof addition came forward in uh, September of 2014 and was approved by the commission. Uh, a partial C of A was issued for a sort of first phase of work to prepare the building for to receive the two-story addition. Uh, so that, that permit included some structural reinforcements, building infrastructure upgrades, uh, an expanded main building lobby to accommodate a new passenger elevator, which would comply with all current 
ADA and stretcher capacity regulations um, and some expanded bulkheads to accommodate the extension of that code, new code compliant elevator to the approved rooftop addition. Um, that, that work, that first phase of work was completed between 2017 and 2019. Um, and the permit and approval for the, for the two-story addition expired last September of 2020. And the owners ultimately decided not to proceed with this, this two-story addition, largely because of construction logistics. Uh, it, it would have required the building to remain largely vacant for, for many years during construction. Um, and they have rethought their approach uh, to this building in the meantime. And we are proposing instead a roof terrace uh, for passive recreation use for use by the office tenants. Uh, the occupants, the office occupancy will, will remain. Um, I do wanna just look quickly at this view from the north. This is still the previous edi rooftop addition proposal. This view was critical in the design discussions in, in that last review because it is, it is a secondary facade, but it's highly, highly visible from within the Ladies Mile District. So there was a lot of discussion about material treatment at this facade, and some of those same issues will come up in, in the view of the current proposal. Existing conditions photos at the current rooftop, you can see in this center photo in, in the, at the top, this area is where the new elevator, uh, fully code compliant elevator was added and a new elevator bulkhead is located toward the Broadway facade, which is where the main building entry is. Um, better seen in a full bird's eye view of the building, uh, existing elevator and stair bulkheads located at the sort of northwest facing lock line wall toward Broadway. This is the new elevator bulkhead. The existing elevator was situated between the new elevator and egress stair. Currently only one egress stair extends to the roof. Um, the remainder of the roof is occupied by some mechanical equipment, which is somewhat abandoned uh, and or will be relocated as part of this application three skylights to the sixth floor below, an existing sprinkler tank, water tanks, and an area of mechanical equipment to the north along 18th Street. That equipment will all remain. And our proposal includes extending the stretcher compliant elevator to the new rooftop terrace, which is consistent with the previous rooftop addition approval we would be providing a vestibule for that elevator for weather protection. The existing stair and elevator bulkhead remains in the same location. That bulkhead will be expanded a bit to the east to accommodate two single occupant toilets for, for the terrace occupants. Um, at the north portion of the roof, that water tanks, sprinkler tank, mechanical equipment all remains a new acoustic barrier between the occupied terrace and mechanical area will be provided and some pergolas along the east will provide sun protection and weather protection for some smaller gathering meeting breakout spaces for the office tenants. And this, this entire terrace will sit on a steel platform that is raised above the sloping roof. Again, this this newer approach to, to this project assumes that the building will remain fully occupied during construction. So maintaining that existing roof, the existing drainage slopes to gutter and leader is all critical to the, to the design. And a protective guardrail will also be provided along the edge of the terrace platform. A mock-up was constructed to confirm visibility. Um, at the top, photos of the bulkhead extension mock-ups. In the center, a photo of the railing mock-up. And on the bottom are the pergolas. I, I do wanna just point out that the, the orange netting that was used to indicate the top of the pergola structure 
uh, that is not the true thickness of what will be proposed. So we've highlighted in these red lines that you know, the, the pergolas will, will be open at the sides and we'll have a thinner horizontal expression. And we looked at visibility from throughout the neighborhood. Uh, just want to point out that in this key plan, the gray shaded area is the boundary of the Ladies Mile District. So uh, most views from within the district are of secondary facades, views from Union Square Park and points south and east are of the primary facades. Sightline studies from directly across the street show that the bulkhead extension will be visible from directly across the street on Broadway, um, both at the corner and over the lower buildings to the north. Um, the additions will not be visible from 18th Street and from the curb at, across the street at 17th Street, not visible, but we all know Union Square offers uh, unobstructed views uh, for many blocks. So we'll, we'll look through those, those views in the next slides. First view from the corner of 17th, the south side of 17th Street, just west of Broadway. The bulkhead extension is visible, a small, a small portion of the raised platform and glass railing will be visible over the lower buildings to the north. Um, and in this enlarged view at the bottom is that portion at the west lot line wall. There is a, a gap, which I'll, I'll show a, a section detail to, to further explain. There's a gap between the, the raised terrace platform and the existing roof and gutter. We're proposing to close that gap off with a metal panel fascia to be painted in a color to match the secondary brick. Um, we've treated the visible portions of the elevator bulkhead and vestibule bulkhead with a light colored stucco um, to match the buff brick of the primary facade and to not detract from that, that very strong uh, expression of the burgundy cornice. From a bit further uh, west on 17th Street, the accretions at the at the west and, and northern portion of the roof become not visible. The bulkhead is still visible, uh, but the further west you go, that, that visibility disappears by the time you get to Fifth Avenue. View from the top of Union Square, uh, pergolas are visible. The bulkhead extension is not visible in this view. Uh, you can see in the blow up view, the enlarged view, we are proposing to raise the lot line wall. Uh, cur the current wall sort of steps down with the slope of the roof. We would take the highest point of that parapet, extend it all the way across, and that would allow the framing for the new terrace to frame into the bearing wall. And then moving a bit further east toward Park Avenue South, pergola is still visible. The bulkhead extension becomes minimally visible. Railing is visible um, at the lot line and in between the scalloped portions of the, the existing cornice. And then moving into Union Square Park, the bulkhead does become visible. Um, but and again, we've we've selected a light color stucco to mimic the, the primary facade and really maintain that that expression of the cornice. Pergolas are partially visible. Another view from, from the park. Again, visible, but seen in the context of the vegetation and trees within the park. And I do want to point out building two doors to the east is an individual landmark with a highly visible uh, bulkhead addition above its two-story mansard roof. And then once you get 
further south, the bulkhead remains visible, but it starts to become seen against other buildings in the background and not, not against the sky. So this is a view from 14th Street looking north and then further south at 13th Street and 12th Street. It's still visible, but the building is so far in the distance, it's, it's very barely perceptible. That's the view from, from 12th Street, very far away. <laughs> and then moving to the north. So this is that view that I showed of the previous rooftop uh, proposal here. In this iteration, we are proposing to extend the secondary brick color, uh, ex extend the secondary brick to the horizontal expansion of the bulkhead. And we are treating the portion of the elevator bulkhead. This is where the, the elevator overhead equipment is housed. We're treating that portion still in the lighter colored stucco. And that's consistent with how this bulkhead to the north is treated. This is on, on our building. Um, it's a similar treatment to that, that sprinkler bulkhead. And moving one block. Further north to 19th Street, the bulkhead is still visible. Um, and by the time you get to 20th Street, you're just seeing a, a sliver of the bulkhead and from further north, not visible. And the last two views, just to confirm, there is no visibility of the proposed pergolas or bulkhead extensions from 18th Street. This is looking at the 18th Street facade of our building um, and very, very minimal, <laughs> it's hard to see here, but very minimal uh, visibility of the railing. And I just wanna return to a few views uh, from within the park to point out uh, other buildings with visible bulkheads from Union Square. These are two individual landmarks actually with visible bulkheads that have also been treated simply um, and consistent with the building's primary facade coloration. Views of those same bulkheads from the south side of 14th Street, highly visible. Again, the bulkhead on the Century Building is visible and some much taller bulkheads also visible at the northwest corner. And this is not a bulkhead, but we, we figured we would include a view of the beautiful glass dome addition at Tammany Hall. And, and though not landmarks, there are some other visible bulkheads from within the park in the distance. Um, I just quickly want to go through some section diagrams to explain some of the more technical details, existing section through the roof. The roof slopes from 17th Street and 18th Street to the middle of the building and then slopes uh, west to a gutter and drain pipe at the western inner court. Uh, so it's, it'll be important to maintain all of that, the building's current drainage system uh, to have the least impact on the building occupants. So we have located our raised roof terrace at the, as tight to the highest point of the existing roof and carry that line across. So that's why there's, there's a fairly large gap at the middle of the building, but it is much smaller at the primary facades. And then sections through the existing elevator bulkhead on the left and a section through that, that middle portion where the drainage all directs to a gutter at the west facade. Um, it's easier to see in section details at the railing, at each railing condition, um, at each facade on the left, at the Broadway and 17th Street facades. The uh, terrace platform will be held back from the main building facade. So there'll be somewhat of a buffer zone there. And the platform is located as close to the, the existing roof as possible to allow for enough space to, to um, have, to maintain the current drainage system. Um, and then that would be carried across the center 
detail is that the, the lowest portion of the roof where we're maintaining access to the existing gutter and downspout. Um, and that this is that sort of hung metal panel fascia that would be painted to match the secondary brick color. And then extension of the east lot line bearing wall and the terrace platform will frame into that brick wall. Details at the pergolas, we're proposing to maintain a, a bit more openness at the north and south of the pergolas. And this is the portion of that front pergola that is most visible from the street. The center portions, we're maintaining a more, a more solid roof um, to provide weather protection for any seating areas that would be located below. And the materials are, uh, the, the vertical pieces are metal, painted metal, and the roof elements are wood. And just want to end on this, this axonometric view since it gives a pretty good overview of the project and uh, I can answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions right now. So we'll move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand and uh, I'll turn it over to Sasha to take us through the testimony. Hey, thank you. So I do have one sign up for this item. I'm going to be bringing in Historic District Council. Kathy, you should be in the meeting now. Let's see. Um... All right, I see that you are in the meeting. Okay, all I need for you to do is unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, this is Kathy Burrell speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HCC feels that the project is largely appropriate with the exception of the use of glass in the roof guardrail. The proposed glass railing is quite visible and will reflect an excessive amount of light at the top of the building more minimal pipe rail of wire mesh would be less visible. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm going to take a glance over at the attendees and I do not see any more hands raised. So I'll pass it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. And uh, we do have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 5 recommending denial based on the visibility. Would you like to respond to the comments in particular the suggestion about the railing? Sure, sure. Uh, we, our intention, we talked internally about lighting and reflectivity. Our intention is to use a, a low ref, reflect, reflectivity glass. Um, and although the lighting plan is not fully developed, we do not intend to provide any up lighting close to the, the glass railing. We're, we're really going to keep that, you know, limited to the planter boxes or, you know, beneath the pergolas. We would try to not have it too much reflectivity or any at all at the glass railing. Um, okay. and, and to to community board five's resolution, um, we we completely understand the visibility issue. <laughs> um, and unfortunately the building infrastructure is where it is and the passenger elevator is located very close to the Broadway facade and because that historically is where is where the building entrance has always been. Um, and and we're, we're sort of locked in. <laughs> so, so we understand that no matter what, this is gonna be quite visible to extend the, the bulkhead, the, the elevator to, to the roof to provide accessibility. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson, I think you have a question. Just, yeah, accept my request to unmute. Uh, a question about, um, material and color. If you go back to your uh, axonometric of the roof, and I can understand the bulkhead having the same color as the form of the building. I understand that because it, the, the surface comes up, the plane comes up. Yeah. But these, uh, these elements, why are they a different color? Why are they not also white or also the same color? as The, the pergola elements? Yes. Oh, um, I, I think that was because the pergola we're treating more as part of the occupied area. So that that is just getting a different treatment as spaces that are going to be used by, by the tenants for 
breakout space. Um, and, and the bulkheads are really elements that we're trying to, to recede into the background when, when you're up on the rooftop. But they're also visible. And, and therefore, the, the notion of the visibility of it being the same material as the surface right. kind of conflicts with your whole idea of what you're doing, no? Um, point, point taken. We can <laughs> certainly look at, at color. What, and what, can you just remind us what material and color those pergolas are? The top, the horizontal portions are wood and our intention was to paint um, the vertical posts. To match so the wood those wood. would be metal, but to paint those to match the wood color. Um, but we could certainly think of it, come up with a different color scheme for the metal versus wood elements. Okay, thank you. Other final questions? Okay, commissioners, let's move to close the hearing and have our discussion. So look for my request to unmute you. Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, so this, you know, as we know, as was presented, we have previously approved a, uh, a vertical expansion on this building, um, which is no longer being proposed. And now they are proposing to install and construct discrete uh, elements, separate elements that are more akin to the rooftop utilitarian features that one would find on buildings of this type and age in this historic district. So um, I, I actually did see this mock-up and the elevator is really the most prominent um, portion of this in particularly from the south looking from Union Square where you have wide open views and it's over the primary facade. Um, but I will say that in looking at that, I did look around me and notice that the building next door had a visible bulkhead and the building to the left had a visible across Broadway had a visible bulkhead and that these bulkheads really were sort of very typical features on all of the buildings within the context, which makes sense for their typology. Um, so, you know, I do think that um, the typology lends itself to a bulkhead and the visibility is similar to others, but um, let's have a full discussion about all of the elements, including the pergola and the railings. Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one? Well, yes. Um I think I wrote last night that um, the scale of the bulkhead is fine with me. I, I think it, it works on the, the matching the color of the, of the form itself, the building. It, um, uh, uh, the only issue I, I had was the glass. Right? And I understood the reason why they wanted that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's the modern element that works with someone on the roof. So to push back on the front makes sense. Maybe they could push it back a little bit more. On the side, they could push that back a little bit more too. I, 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 can, I can approve this project. Okay, all right, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. I agree with um, all of uh, uh, Commissioner Jefferson's comments. It's uh, visible, but uh, not atypical in the, um, in the immediate vicinity. Uh, it's not extreme, um, uh, and uh, and as far as the glass railings are concerned, uh, that was going to be another comment. So I, I agree with them. Okay, Commissioner Holford Smith. Uh, I agree with the comments. Um, I just would caution them to make sure that that color of the bulkhead is not too bright. Um, just maybe they can do some the test colors to make sure that. It's a, a, a very muted color, so it doesn't stand out against the sky. I think you might think it's a good, program, a good proposal. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin? Commissioner Chapin? Sorry, I'm muting. <laughs> I, um, I agree. I think that, uh, you know, given that the Department of Buildings requirements on bulkheads, it's it's the best they can do really here. And um, 
I don't, I think that the per pergola visibility is fine. And, um, you know, as far as the glass railing, if it, they're gonna use a relatively non-reflective railing, I think it is probably okay as well. So I can approve it as presented. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I agree with Eberardo's comments. I think that they should push back the glass so that they, uh, the uh, profiled cornice is more uh, un unobstructed. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. I agree with that. I think the glass needs to be moved back so it's not visible. Okay. All right, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I agree with uh, the comments as well as uh, the uh, end suggestion about uh, paying a close attention to the color, not make it too bright. Okay, and Commissioner Lutfi. I agree. There are a lot of accretions uh, and water towers in the area, and uh, I also agree that setting back uh, the glass would be very helpful. Okay. Great, so I think we all agree um, that the proposal for these rooftop accretions is appropriate. However, we recommend that the glass railings be set back to minimize their visibility. So Commissioner Jefferson, would you be able to read the motion? Sure. Thank you. In the matter of LPC-22-02764, 86 Broadway, AKA 27 dash 29 East 17th Street and 32-34 East 18th Street, Ladies Mile Historic District. Application is to construct rooftop addition, raise the parapet and install railing. I, no I note that the building style scale material and details are among the features that contribute to the special architecture and historic character of the Ladies Mile Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications that the, that the building that the building was altered and reclad in 1925 and most of the neo-Gothic style elements removed. And therefore the proposed additions are in keeping with the building history of alterations. That the construction of the proposed rooftop addition will not damage any significant architectural feature of the roof, that although the proposed elevator bulkhead and pergolas will be visible from certain vantage points along the 7th Street, Broadway, and Union Square Park, the addition will be seen as in conjunction with a water tanks and other rooftop accretions on the buildings, on the buildings, on, on the building and other buildings. That the finish of the stair bucket lower portion of the proposed elevator bucket and the metal panel fascia at the west parapet will be finished to match the masonry wall and therefore will help minimize the massing and their presence within the roofscape. That the raised portion of the parapet wall, which will align with the front southern portion of the parapet, will be constructed in brick and therefore will blend with the existing masonry wall and will not diminish the profile of this side elevation, and that the cumulative effect of the rooftop bulkhead pergolas and railings will not overwhelm the building. However, I find that part of the proposed glass railing will be visible behind the decorative cornice and over the primary facade, thereby detracting from one of the only remaining original significant architectural features of the building. Therefore, I recommend that the glass railing be set further back from the primary facade to eliminate them or minimize visibility from the street. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Sorry, I was on mute. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner <coughs> Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford-Smith. Aye. 
with nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, thank you. Thank so you. that's approved. Please continue to work with the staff on the railing. And also I wanna just add that you should also, as always, we look at finishes in the field with staff and you should look at the final finish for that bulkhead to ensure that it's not too bright as Commissioner Holford Smith pointed out. Resolve that it's with the staff is part of the normal process. All right, we'll uh, now go ahead and move to the last two items of the day. Uh, they will be presented together and I'll read them in now. Uh, together. Uh, first is item number nine, LPC 22-03831, an application for a binding report in the borough of Manhattan, block 1111, lot one, Central Park, the Kinderberg, Chess and Checkers House, uh, scenic landmark. Uh, this is a structure built circa 1952 within the Children's District in the southern section of Central Park, an English romantic style public park designed by in 1858 by Olmsted and Fox. Uh, and this application is to modify infill and install partitions. And then item 10, LPC 22-04729. Uh, this is an application for an advisory report uh, and it concerns the plaza and landscaping surrounding the aforementioned structure. Uh, this application is to replace a pergola and paving, install railings and construct a barrier free access ramp. Hey, commissioners, the applicants now have control of the presentation and have entered the hearing. Um, if you will just unmute yourself, you can state your name for the record, advance the slides using your arrow keys, and you may begin. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Christopher Nolan with the Central Park Conservancy. I'm the chief landscape architect. I'm here with my colleagues, Denise Keefney, the Central Park Conservancy, and Lane Ananisio. And uh, as was said, we're here to present uh, a project in the south end of the park, the Kinderberg and the Chess and Checkers House, primarily focused on three primary elements. One, a <clears throat> restoration, uh, the exterior, uh, and some interior work at the Chess and Checkers House, adding a much needed public restroom to the area. Um, the recreation of the Kinderberg, the largest rustic structure uh, originally in the park that was lost, that I sat on top of this octagonal um, plinth on top of the rock outcrop, uh, and then some accessibility improvements to make both elements accessible. Just waiting for it to advance. This is in the south end of the park, just beneath the 65th Street Transverse Road. There's an important relationship between the Chess and Checkers House and the Kinderberg and the dairy historically. The dairy was built right on the 65th Street Transverse Road uh, and Central Park South. Um, part of our work builds on accessibility improvements, which I'll go into, which creates an accessible route from Grand Army Plaza and the southeast corner of the park. First element is to restore this, uh, the most significant rustic structure that was lost uh, in the park sometime in the 1940s. We had rebuilt it referentially with a dimensional lumber pergola in the 1980s. It was the largest rustic structure in the park, uh, part of the children's district. I'll go a little bit into the history. And as part of an, an important, um, one of the kind of primary architectural expressions in the original park was rustic architecture. Small elements and large, small elements like benches, large elements like these large uh, summer houses or houses on top of rock outcrops often to capitalize on beautiful views across the park or be spots where people actually had little respites from within the kind of hustle and bustle of activity in the park. Um, this area is, uh, the Kinderberg is right here, just adjacent, just west of the dairy um, on top of a large rock outcrop just beneath the 65th Street Transverse Road and was part of a system of really three significant rustic structures in the south end of the park. Copcott coming in just off the 6th Avenue entrance that was rebuilt sometime in the late 1980s, the Kinderberg in the middle of that, and then one over here uh, on the east side, just north of the Billy Johnson playground at like 68th Street, uh, the Dean Summer House. Uh, and you can see the Copcott restored in the mid 1980s, 1985. Um, we've actually rebuilt it. We have built capacity in the organization. 
um, to build most of the rustic structures in-house. We do all the infill. We have a crew now that can maintain them in the long term and be really stewards of this important element. This is this will be putting this back. We'll bring back the largest uh, and kind of mo most biggest expression. Second piece of this is actually creating accessibility. As I said, there's an ex there's a connection between the Kinderberg in some respects is an accessory structure to the dairy. The utilities are actually uh, interconnected and we've created an accessible route to the dairy as part of uh, our most recent work. It is now open to the public. Um, you get a sense we've got this accessible route coming in from Grand Army Plaza all the way in. Uh, an accessible ramp was built adjacent to the path to get you down. We modified some grades and the entrances. Um, the dairy is accessible. There is no public restroom at the dairy. Um, and our goal is to actually make an accessible route from here across up to the Kinderberg. It's not really accessible from the west side, and I can go into that when I get into some greater detail. Um, this is the restored loggia, um, just recently opened to the public, and our goal is to make it accessible from this point here across. You can get a sense of the rock outcrop. The rock outcrop actually has soil on top of it here, the set of steps. It's not really accessible to make it accessible from the west side. There's two points of access to the Kinderberg. One on the east where the steps are, which was the original kind of connection to the dairy up the set of steps. You can go down the hill underneath Playmate Arch. There's a significant grade change there. That's not accessible. And it's like a third of a mile to trace your way back south and then back up the east drive to the west side. Um, uh, and there's actually a significant grade change there. We actually had at one point evaluated this. Not only is it not, um, it's tremendously out of the way in terms of the connection to the dairy, a third of a mile. But the retaining walls to support the ramp would have to be built right on top of the rock outcrop. And unlike the east side, there's no opportunity to kind of ground them in landscape uh, and they would kind of stick out and actually block views to the actual rustic structure. A little history on the site. The Kinderberg was kind of a central element in the middle of what was referred to as the children's district, which stretched between the drives. Uh, it was part of the ball ground, the original playground, Hexra playground today. The public restroom that exists in this district is all the way down here and there's significant grade change to get to it. There was the Kinderberg. There was actually in a historic swing set outside the Kinderberg, uh, 19th century swing set. There was a small, it was called the children's cottage. It was actually an outhouse um, that was lost sometime in the early 20th century and the dairy. Um, and there were kind of relationship between those two in terms of services that, that kind of uh, focused on the smallest uh, uh, you know, children uh, and their caregivers. It was an extraordinary rustic structure, an open pergola that was around a central element that stuck up from the pergola that had a solid roof. Uh, significant grade change from the adjacent path up to the Kinderberg itself, just under 14 feet of grade change um, and would have had at one time panoramic views around, but also this sense of kind of enclosure around the other elements within the children's district. And you can see it was a really stereoscopic view from the 19th century. Uh, very intricate, lots of benches, tables for children to sit at and play board games. You can get a sense of the overhead structure. You'll notice that there was brick paving historically. I'll touch on that a little bit later in our proposal. 1930s view, the rustic structure existed at some point in some level of configuration through the 20th century. Sometime between 1930 and 1940, it was lost. You get a sense of this is the carousel on the West Drive, Playmates Arch going under here that drops down, the dairy where the loja, um, with its loja before it was lost, um, generally about where the children's cottage was uh, and the Kinderberg on top of this beautiful rock outcrop. This is a lobe of the 59th Street Pond um, where that was filled in uh, and Woman Rink was built. Sometime between that photograph and the mid 1940s, the pergola was removed. You get a sense of the paving that was there. It was brick uh, historically. The actual footprint, the small retaining wall with the bluestone coping all exists and it's a historic element. The paving was repaved at some point uh, when, the, when this um, chest and checker shelter was added in 1952. It was originally constructed. It's a small octagonal shaped building, flex the form of the actual footprint of the Kinderberg itself. It was built as basically a shelter. It did not have heat. Um, there was a slop sink um, inside, but there were no other utilities beyond that. Um, there was a main entrance and it was, it was designed to actually facilitate both uh, as much outdoor programming as the indoor programming. It had a series of doors that opened up and folded in um, uh, and facilitated chess and checkers. There was uh, over time, additional chess and checker tables were added uh, must have been a, a, a rather um, not much reprieve from the sun. 
um, but this, uh, you get a sense of the original footprint and the relationship at this point in 1953, the original loggia was lost. The Conservancy restored that in the 80s and recently done it again. And you get a sense of the relationship between the two facilities. From an existing conditions perspective, um, as I mentioned, the exterior kind of small retaining wall built on top of the rock outcrop and its bluestone coping remains. Um, in the 1950s, we believe the brick was replaced with, hex, with the hex pavers. The 1980s, we actually um, redid some work up there uh, and replaced um, or recreated a pergola and a dimensional lumber, significantly smaller inboard um, from the footprint uh, and kind of wrapped the building around. The structure itself uh, or the plaza itself is in need of repair. Paving is heaved, the dimensional lumber uh, um, pergola um, is beyond its useful life um, uh, uh, and needs to be kind of completely redone. The paving, the benches all, uh, a footprint of the um, areas around the trees uh, need to be larger to facilitate them. The trees were added at some point um, pre-1980 um, and are mature and are in good health. Moving around the building itself, the core and shell of the building uh, um, is essentially intact. The, uh, the doors and windows have been replaced over time. The main door, the entrance door, which is this east elevation, Denise will go into that in some detail as we talk about our work, um, uh, remains as it originally was. Facility needs to be cleaned, repointed. The roof needs to be replaced. This heating unit uh, was uh, temporarily installed during COVID. We actually outfitted the facility to facilitate staff space to kind of allow social distancing for operation staff to work through COVID. And that will be removed uh, uh, and the heating system will be integrated inside. And just moving around the facility itself. Um, from an interior perspective, um, it's an octagonal space. Uh, we do some programming in there. Um, we basically, the primary programming is we launch tours from there. Um, we answer questions to the public uh, and we hand out uh, board games, primarily chess and checkers, but other board games, people play outdoors. We do have some tables inside, but it's primarily used outside. And singularly, one of the biggest questions these people are asked is where is the public restroom? And we hand them a map and direct them over to the Hexer playground. Um, um, and uh, the addition of the public restroom is a, is a giant improvement for the area. Um, and will in no way diminish or um, uh, reduce the level of programming we provide in the area. The exterior chess and checkers tables, um, there's ad hoc games that happen. School groups come up and get the checkers from us or, or chess pieces from us and play. The tables are also used um, for other uses. People eat their lunch there, they go up there and read. It is a nice reprieve off of the drive to get up there um, and, and get a little pull off from the activity of the park itself. And then through the warm months, we actually do facilitate more robust chess programming. Um, where we bring in a grandmaster, set up tables. Uh, and this is actually not having a public restroom for an event like this is, is, is kind of under um, um, not great programming for a perspective. So we'll be able to maintain all this level of programming with the public restrooms um, in the proposed improvements. And I'm gonna turn it over to Denise to actually go through the architectural work um, on the actual chess and checker structure itself. Um, hello, commissioners. My name is uh, Denise Keevney. I'm with Central Park Conservancy, and I'm just going to take you through the scope of work that we're proposing to do at the actual Chess and Checkers building. Um, as uh, Chris had touched on previously, uh, we will be doing some masonry cleaning, roof replacement and cupola replacement, um, and we will also be doing window and door replacement. So looking here at the um, on the left hand side, you have a 1950 just after it was built in 1952. I want to draw your attention to um, the main entrance door, which is a double door. Um, and this, in the center, you have got what was the folding door, which existed on four sides and uh, folded to the interior to allow the building to open up to the exterior. At some point before 1980, um, looking at the existing photograph, actually all the openings, uh, the door openings were replaced um, with double doors and they're all of the same. Uh, so the folding door was lost. The original windows are wood windows, double hung. They are existing since the 1950s um, and will be replaced in kind. One thing I should point out before we uh, was that there is grill work at the windows and doors and that will be um, removed and will not be reinstalled. Uh, looking here at the existing elevation from 1952 drawings, you can see that the original and um, primary entrance was a double door and it was metal. Um, and then the wood, the, the folding doors were actually wood, but they were actually clad with a, a steel plate. And then on the opposite side, you can see that when they opened up, you basically just saw the, the, the masonry opening. 
Um, the existing elevation shows that we have all the doors are all double doors, all the same. Now we, hear, we have 1952 and what we are proposing to do. So what we're proposing to do is to um, replace in kind the primary door. So acknowledge and to reference the original design with having a primary entry door and having secondary doors, if you will. So we're show, proposing to replace in kind the, the primary double door um, and to also acknowledge like the three divisions that we had for, this, for the secondary doors. Um, and with a single door then that would be operable. Um, and the, the, all of the openings would have a fixed um, transom above. This is an existing floor plan against the existing floor plan. It shows the folding doors as it uh, opened up to the interior with a double door at the bottom of the plan for the main entry. The existing conditions shows all the doors out swinging, um, all of the same type. So, um, this is an existing floor plan. Basically, it's an open floor plan, which we have outfitted with some furniture. Um, we, do, we did build in some partitions, which is an indication where we have the red lines on this plan. Um, and then we also have just a staff uh, restroom in that small little room there off to the side. So the proposed work on the interior um, includes um, a renovation and to create uh, public restrooms um, so what we're looking at here is the proposed plan, male and female restrooms with a gender neutral restroom, but also an area to the front, which will uh, allow um, CPC to have staff, which will be able to facilitate the use of the chess and checker tables to the exterior. So we'll still be able to hand out like uh, chess pieces or game boards as necessary for use on the exterior and to answer any information. And also there's a level of like, um, I guess, uh, oversight of the restrooms as well. In order to make this a year, it'll be a year round public restroom, uh, we're going to be creating a mezzanine level, which is accessed through the rear of the building through those single use doors. Um, and we're putting uh, the heating and cooling um, equipment up on the mezzanine level, which is accessed by the stairs, obviously. What we're looking at here is the proposed elevations. Um, so this really uh, shows the two types of glazing that we're proposing to use. So the main elevation is the east elevation. So this is as you approach coming up from the steps as you approach the building, that will be just clear, transparent glass. We'll be going back with all steel doors with insulated glass unit one inch thick. Um, and then as you work your way around and the actual openings are opening onto the public restrooms or onto the mechanical spaces at the back, we're proposing etched glass, like our glass that allows for some light to come in, but gives the privacy required. And that's what you see in the south. And then you work your way through the west. Um, there is a, an ele a louver element for, which allows for exhaust, um, which is connected to the mechanical equipment. We also will have some exhaust through the, louver, through the louvers at the existing cupola, which we are replacing lead coated copper finish. Um, and then you work your way around to the south elevation again. So these are just some, um, you know, in large details, this is the primary entrance door, uh, double doors, uh, steel door with um, clear glazing, one inch insulated. Um, and it's uh, SDL lights, five eighths of an inch in, in dimension. The next slide shows the um, secondary type door, if you will, uh, of which there are four. Um, and in the, as you approach it from the front, the center um, door is the operable one. Um, and to the rear, then it's one on the side. And the, um, the, this is one of the, there's actually two of these openings, they're um, double hung wood windows going to be replaced in kind, again, just with the added, just changing out um, the glazing type. And the single one, that, and then I think that's it. I'll hand it back to Chris now that he will speak to the Kinderberg. So the significant, uh... Um, kind of element of the project in addition to just the addition of the public restroom is the recreation of um, the lost rustic structure of the Kinderberg. This is a, the top elevation is a 19, uh, 1866 uh, historic drawing. You get a sense that it was a, an open pergola that facilitated wisteria growth with a kind of central elevated element roof with a solid roof, which um, down below is the existing condition. Um, the dimensional lumber pergola built in the mid 1980s by the conservancy. Those trees have been added as our intent to maintain those trees as elements within the park that kind of create some scale to the Kinderberg, uh, I'm sorry, to the Chess and Checkers house um, and kind of ground it um, and do provide shade. 
um, in the area. And our intent is essentially to build on the historic photographs and historic drawings to recreate the pergola around it, um, not building the central element, leaving the chess and checkers facility in, in place, and essentially that having to be referential to the original kind of covered element around it. Um, Denise and our team work pretty closely in terms of kind of getting the column spacing correct relative to uh, working within the footprint of uh, the existing Kinderberg uh, oct octagonal shape, um, making sure that we can actually cantilever the original structure cantilevered over the edge, um, and getting the columns in there correctly and building a sense of columns around the existing structure to kind of envelop the structure itself um, in the rustic element. This is a plan of what it is working around the existing trees. You will notice, I'll notice the pavement. The pavement is currently hexagonal pavers. Our proposal is actually to maintain the hexagonal pavers. Um, so we're not competing with the brick of the 1950s structure itself. They're non-directional and kind of work um, uh, with the, the non-directional, all the column spacing. And our proposed plan. Um, cantilever it over the edge, column spacing, basing built on uh, the kind of historic layout of the columns um, with a, um, an adequate amount of space. Uh, I think at its tightest spot here is about eight feet off um, uh, with five feet off the edge of the pergola um, to, to the roof line itself. And again, on the column spacing, working on the historic plan, getting them in columns just in off the edge the actual thing will cantilever off at the outside series of columns will have an integrated as it was historically an integrated guard um, with a kind of rustic uh, tracery um, decorative elements in it. Series of benches inside um, with chess and checkers tables. Um, I think the important thing we're trying to accomplish here is not all of the benches will be associated with a checkers table. So people will actually have the opportunity to kind of play at a table or sit at a table and eat their lunch but also have um, benches that actually look outward into the park as part of the landscape experience or sit and kind of watch um, other people play chess or just sit on a bench like you would anywhere else out in the park's landscape in our model. Um, uh, from a fixtures perspective, all of the integrated benches into the historic structure will be rustic in character, building on the kind of historic drawings we have and historic photographs built by our restoration carpentry crew. Um, the chess and checkers tables will be simple, kind of nondescript, wood bottoms with inlay uh, wood tabletops and wood bench, uh, uh, wood bench slats um, with an integrated uh, chess and checkers uh, board uh, with simple steel painted black steel posts. And just some examples of our rustic crew's work, rustic footbridges over in the West 70s, an area called Ladies Pond, some of the other elements, this is Billy Johnson playground, rustic playground. Uh, and I just want to touch on the last element of the project is making the Kinderberg and the public restrooms accessible, the accessibility improvements. As I mentioned earlier, there's about just under a 14 foot grade change between um, uh, the pedestrian path here and the Kinderberg itself, kind of a math exercise, similar to work we have done um, uh, in other accessibility improvements. This is an architectural treatment. Our intent is not to treat this as part of the paths the, the park's circulation system, like the staircase architectural and relates to the facility, the ramp actually functions and services kind of technically in the same perspective. We have the opportunity to ground this in the landscape. And there are some constraints relative to the elevation we need to make and trees in the adjacent area. Um, and again, this builds on accessibility improvements coming from the dairy I had touched on before. We did evaluate pretty quickly the opportunity to get to the west side, but there's significant grade change. It's a much, much greater distance than the idea that these are public restrooms. People go to the dairy and say, where are the public restrooms? We can now direct them up here. And the idea that there's a point of entry here, um, there's a constraint to what we can do from a tree. Um, it's just about 200 feet of ramp, the math works out and we can kind of fit that in. And the idea is the ramp will parallel the contour lines and we'll be able to actually fill um, and use the existing soil to create kind of planted buffers so those retaining walls are actually actually grounded in the landscape itself. And I think our imagery will show what it is. Um, point of entry is exactly the same spot as the point of access and the existing staircase and the ramp lets out the same spot from an equity perspective, they begin and end at the same spot. That actually works well here. We can't always make that uh, accomplish that goal. There's a series uh, ramps one on 12, like any uh, accessible ramp with landings is necessary. The math works out. There are some sections where the retaining walls are over 30 inches that require a guard. 
um, the guard, and I'll show this in a section, will have a cantilevered handrail where we don't need a guard, it'll just be a single handrail. The staircase itself um, is from a building code perspective because it goes to a facility is wide enough that it requires three sets of handrails. And I'll show that in the sections. Um, so from a sectional perspective, there are some sections, as I mentioned, that the walls actually will be higher than 30 inches. Our intent is they will be cast in place concrete walls with a bluestone veneer. The intent behind using the bluestone is to kind of treat it as an architectural treatment in a modern way, um, or in a contemporary way, I should say, as a contemporary element within the park, but have the material be dis distinct, but referential in terms of material perspective um, to the masonry of the Kinderberg and the other materials around the park. And it'll be kind of well-grounded within the landscape. And then we have some examples of that. There are some spots as you move east on the ramp where it retains on both sides. And again, there are sections where it's just over 30 inches that we need the guard, a cantilevered handrail. Our guard, we've used in other areas of the park, very simple steel post, top rail with a wire mesh infill. We've used it, it um, almost becomes a transparent railing um, when seen uh, in the context of the landscape and the plantings itself. So some um, uh, perspective renderings on this Photoshop renderings on it. As I said, um, the staircase is wide enough because a point of access to a building with a CFO and an occupancy, it requires three handrails. Um, this redbud tree will be transplanted and uh, somewhere else in the park. Um, and it's up this slope that we parallel the contours uh, and bring the ramp in. Point of entry here. You get the sense of here, um, this is where we expose the existing cheek wall of the existing staircase. The staircase will be rebuilt, all the masonry and the stone will be reused, bluestone treads will be reused, bluestone copings on the cheek walls will be reused. Uh, and there is a small, there's a length of it here where the drop is more than 30 inches where the handrail will be cantilevered over a rather transparent guard. That guard is restricted to only the areas where the drop requires it. Um, and as you move up the ramp itself, handrails, you get a sense of the bluestone, the, the concrete bluestone clad wall um, behind the plantings itself. These are where the highest retainage is, where we have the plant material. You get a sense of the view of the new rustic Kinderberg um, behind it um, and sections where the retaining wall, the drop to the adjacent landscape um, requires a guard and the intent of this use is very transparent guard. And if you looking from this perspective, looking up the ramp itself. Um, and again, it's about a 200 foot linear run with the landings itself um, to navigate the just over 14, just under 13, 14 feet grade change coming in. Um, some sections of path that are rebuilt essentially in kind with the typical curbing we, we do. And as I mentioned, the staircase will be built in kind, salvaging and reusing all the existing bluestone. Uh, there might be a unit or two that will need to be replaced. We do it pretty regularly and actually even have stockpiles of those bluestone treads within the park. And as I had mentioned, the rustic work, um, um, our rustic crew, I think the key thing about our stewardship of these rustic structures is we have the capacity to build them, but it doesn't last forever. And we have the capacity to maintain them and kind of be stewards of this kind of beautiful element of the historic park. And we just ended with all our community boards, the idea that uh, the ramp is kind of an architectural element in the park, like staircases are, the geometry um, is not like the path circulation that's intentional. Um, it's efficient from a, from a grading perspective. Um, and the idea is that as the plant things grow in, the ramp and its intervention becomes as kind of uh, uh, unobtrusive as actually possible while allowing public access. And that is everything. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, do we have any questions? It was a very thorough presentation. So I think um, we don't have questions at this time, but we'll move to public testimony and we may after that. So if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sasha to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So first I'll be calling on friends of the Upper East Side. You should be receiving a request from me. I see that you are rejoining. You're now in the meeting. Please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Uh, hi, uh, this is Laura Varelli representing Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Chair Carroll and Honorable Commissioners, Friends Preservation Committee appreciates the challenges at hand in this application. Balancing a practical program and the 
restoration of the 1950s open air building with the recreation of a long disappeared romantic element of the park's original rustic design. Furthermore, we value the addition of more public and accessible restrooms at Central Park, one of the most frequented landmarks in the city. We understand that the proposed use doesn't allow for the reinstallation of the historic fully operable tripartite wooden doors and commend the applicant on the creativity of the proposed door system that resembles the original and works with the constraints of the interior space. The existing dimensional lumbar, lumbar pergola is out of sync, both with the chess and checkers house and the overall landscape of the park. Friends appreciates the recreation of the rustic pergola and believes that it will soften the transition between the landscape and the building. This hybrid approach to rebuild this long gone element while maintaining and restoring the 1950s incursion reintroduces the 19th century bucolic setting of the park while providing modern day amenities to park goers. Nonetheless, the building is somewhat obscured by the pergola and we believe it needs a little, a little more air in order to successfully coexist with the reintroduced element. Finally, we appreciate the effort to make this area completely accessible and code compliant and think that the proposed solution is both successful and sensible. However, the additional handrails create a heavy look that could easily be remediated with a different color railing or perhaps thinner handrails. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next I'll be calling on Sean Chrisandi from Landmark West. Sean, you should be receiving a request from me. I see that you are in the meeting. Please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, Commissioner Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. The Certificate of Appropriateness Committee received a preview presentation of this application on December 2nd, which clarified many of our finer grain questions. During our discussion, we learned that the ramp was chosen for this location in order to provide continuity with an existing ADA network of connected paths. Given that clarification and barring less obtrusive ramp locations, we support this proposal. Although this imposes a specific front and back on what was formerly a flexible pavilion, further removing it from its 1953 experience, our committee finds that adding additional park amenities not only enhances user experience, but improves the city and is a net gain. Partly repurposing the underutilized Chess and Checkers House will expand the visitor promenade from the dairy and address a longstanding need for restrooms. In doing so, the applicant will make chess and checkers accessible, offering all mobilities access to a recognized promontory within the scenic landmark. Although not a true restoration to the original design intent of a fully rustic structure, this proposal uses discerning creative license to unite different periods of the park's history while updating and improving upon them for today's park goers. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee found this hybrid proposal a public benefit and supports approval. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next I will be calling on John Graham from Victorian Society, New York. John, you should be receiving a request from me. I see that you are in the meeting now. Please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, Commissioners. John Graham for the VSNY. The Chest and Checkers House is no more appropriate to Central Park today than it was when it was built in 1952. We regret that the Central Park Conservancy and Parks Department do not more boldly seek to eliminate intrusive 20th century features like this one that conflict with Olmsted and Box's brilliant park design. The work proposed for the brick structure itself seems appropriate, though the level of detail in the presentation is so minimal that we're not sure. The slate roof is to be replaced, but with what? Details for the new cupola? Windows and doors are also lacking. Even if those features are subject to staff review, this information should be provided so the public and the commissioners understand the full scope of the project. We trust that the HVAC unit mounted to the building's wall seen on slide 22 was installed without the required commission review, and that as part of this project, it will be removed and relocated according to sound principles of preservation and aesthetics. The SNY strongly supports the enlargement and redesign of the pergola. The new, more rustic appearance of the pergola and its furnishings will serve to better obscure the masonry pavilion and will be much closer in appearance to the original Kinderberg and in keeping with the character of most of the park's original structures and pergolas. We find, however, that the proposed access ramp is extremely inappropriate to the character of Central Park. This kind of gash through the landscape is antithetical to the 
um, naturalistic and picturesque character that is the entire basis of the original design of Central Park. The precedent to which it is being compared at the arsenal is not appropriate as that is a sloped walk, not a ramp with walls and railings. Also, the character of the section of the park near the arsenal is completely different, dominated by the formality of the arsenal and the adjacent zoo. Here at the Kinderberg, we are in the heart of the park where every alteration should be premised on supporting the naturalistic and picturesque character of the original Ross in our Bay Park plan, which as Olmsted admonished is a single work of art. The two examples of ramps to playgrounds shown on slides 63 and 64 demonstrate exactly the devastating effect that features have on the naturalist uh, landscape. It appears that a less intrusive ramp could be installed on the opposite side of the Kinderberg from Center Drive. This area is shown in the excellent photo on the 10th board. This seems to be a less sensitive area than the dairy landscape, and the grade change appears to be less. Mr. Nolan noted that people at the dairy need a restroom. I suggest people on the center drive also need restrooms. Finally, wherever a ramp may be located, the materials, detailings, and of its facing, railings, and pavements should fit the historic character of the park, not conflict with it. Box and Mold knew how to design beautiful yet recessive work structures park structures by using dark, often rock-based stone and ornamental metal and wood features whose detailing blends with park foliage. Long, flat, straight, bright, undifferentiated surfaces are anathema. Concrete, which is the apparent material for the ramps, um, paving should be not be visible anywhere in Central Park. Thank you very much, commissioners. You. Next, I'll be calling on Historic District Council You'll be receiving a request from me now. Okay, I see that you are in the meeting. You can please unmute your mic and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, this is Kathy Burrell speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HGC overall commends this project. However, we asked the Parks Department to plant the area around the ramp with evergreens to minimize its visibility throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, to my side, I do see one, I have one more hand raised. Christabel Goff, I am going to bring you in now into the meeting. You should receive a request from me. Okay, Christabel, I see that you are in the meeting. You just need to Unmute your mic, please, and state your name for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Uh, this is Christabel Goff speaking for the Society for the Architecture of the City. The creation of access ramps in the park is an important undertaking, but their design needs to be integrated with the rustic landscape of the park so that users can enjoy the same experience an impression of verdant greenery and wild rock outcroppings, nature in the midst of the city that is available to all others. This could be achieved here through design modifications to the proposed ramp. The illustration entitled B, Approach from the Dairy, suggests that the proposed use of stark right angles in the layout and smooth bright white retaining walls as illustrated is incompatible with the character of other paths in the park. Instead, retaining walls and curbs might better continue the rough natural stone of the base of the pavilion and its porch. The use of materials, colorations, and configurations not normally seen in other parts of the historic park should be avoided if the true intent of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is equality in access, is to be maintained. Alternatively, access is available through the much more level approach path on the other side of the building, a path already shown on the Bogart map of 1873 with very little new construction, relatively speaking, needed. The Chess House has a circular footprint and is about to undergo extensive renovation. So any contention that an entrance legally designated as the front must be located at the stone stair where the slope is at its steepest seems arbitrary at best. The distance from the chess house to the dairy, if that is an issue, is not significantly greater by the alternate route. 
Further, we were surprised that the terrace and its ramp have been classified as landscape rather than as the structures that they are, thus calling for a non-binding advisory report. We question whether this interpretation would survive legal challenge. And as always, we strongly oppose any erosion of procedural standards. Thank you. All right. Um, let me just take one more glance. I do not see any more hands raised. Okay, so I will hand it back over to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. And I will also just note for the record that we did receive a resolution from the Manhattan Community Board 5 recommending approval of the application. Okay, I'd like to turn it back over to the applicants to see if you'd like to respond to some of the comments or any of the comments. Um, I think what I'll, there, were, there was a kind of array of comments. I think that I would respond by just saying, we tried to hit the mark that I think Sean from Landmarks West responded to was kind of balancing um, the, the different layers of the park and relative to the, in, in the context of the detailing was to make, uh, make the elements, the ramp as an element distinct. So it's not interpreted or replicating any kind of historic detailing. Um, so it, it reads, um, it's, it's, it has context in the landscape. It's planted to, um, to be screened. Um, there's some comments about the detailing on the handrails. All of the engineering on the handrails was the minimum dimensional pieces. There's no extra decorative elements in there at all um, to kind of meet the kind of baseline code requirements and provide the necessary accessibility. I think I would also just um, add, I think there were a couple of comments um, in a, in a, from a couple of people about, um, about suggesting that the ramp from the other side, from the west side would be preferable. I think Chris did, um, did hit that in the presentation, but just to, just to clarify, um, it's uh, a, much, a much further distance. It's <clears throat> about a third of a mile as opposed to 200 feet from the dairy because uh, it may appear on a map that it's a close distance, but um, you actually have to go under an arch and around um, a third of a mile to come back from the other direction to get to the other side. So it's not, it's not uh, in proximity. In addition to not being feasible because as Chris mentioned of the, of the rock um, and the, the amount of run that would be needed. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, do you have any final questions? Anything that raised that you thought of yourself or that you thought of after listening to testimony and listening to the response? Okay, I think we are ready to begin our discussion then. So I am sending a request to unmute all of you so that we can close the hearing and begin our discussion. So um, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion and just to, to provide a, a context for our discussion. We have two applications before us um, and one is for the alterations to the structure itself and the other is for all of the other alterations. And the reason we have two applications is because the Lemarks Commission is binding on alterations to existing structures within scenic landmarks. And uh, for all other changes in scenic landmarks, the Public Design Commission has binding jurisdiction and will review it after the LPC. So we issue an advisory report for those for those uh, aspects of the application. Sarah, so, Sarah, yes. if I could just, just <clears throat> correct you one minor thing. We are binding only on existing buildings, not structures. Okay, existing <laughs> buildings, which is, explains why we're not right. looking at the pergola as part of the binding report. So Correct. thank you for correcting me. So yes, buildings. So um, we can, well, as we talk about the applications, let's first maybe talk about the changes to the building and then talk about the changes to the, the rest of the scenic landmark, including the structure and the barrier free access ramp. Um, Commissioner Chapin, would you like to start this one? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, so I think I think this is in general, um, you know, um, an excellent uh, proposal in the sense that it's dealing with a lot of very serious issues for the park. Uh, I think with regard to the 
changes the chess and checkers house. Although as been, has been pointed out, this is a more recent addition to the park and not necessarily the most uh, felicitous one, but at the same time, we have, there are a number of this type of changes that have been made to the park <clears throat> over time. And I think converting this to a bathroom as its primary use, as well as a visitor center and place to hand out the uh, games uh, to the public is a good direction and has been well <coughs> done in general. I don't have any problem with the conversion that is being made to the Chess and Checkers House. <clears throat> and I think it's an economic way to achieve the goals uh, for this facility rather than trying to create some new, go back to creating some other structure. Uh, with regard to the Kinderberg Pergola, I think that's terrific. Um, I hope that it can be uh, done in a way that is as close as possible to the Olmsted concept, which it appears, uh, it, it appears that they are trying to do. And I think that's excellent. The accessibility ramp uh, is a little more complicated. Um, there, as was pointed out, there's an excellent ramp uh, over by the arsenal and they weren't able to uh, treat it in as, um, let's say a light a fashion because of the way where the switchback is going and the grades and so forth. <laughs> I was interested in the suggestion that it be uh, relocated. Uh, and I guess that part of the issue is trying to come from the dairy area. And obviously that's much too long of an area, but also that there is some uh, rock involved, which might make it less feasible to create uh, an, an appropriate ramp from another direction. So if there were another direction, I would support that, but it appears that Parks has considered that and does not feel it's possible to uh, find a decent alternative uh, approach. In the absence of that, I think that uh, as some, some of the uh, speakers suggested, there should be some effort made to rusticate the ramp so that it doesn't look as intrusive and modern. Yes, it, it will always be an intrusive element to some extent, but obviously there's, there's gonna be an attempt to have uh, uh, landscaping grow around it and, and uh, make it and blend it more into the park. But also I think if it could either have a stone facing or rustication of some sort uh, that could make it appear more, uh, in, blend in better with the Kinderberg, uh, I think that would be a very desirable. So that would be my primary suggestion about the proposal. And in general, I think that the three things they're trying to do which is, you know, provide a public bathroom, which is critical in this park, uh, accessibility, which is also extremely obviously important, and returning to the Kinderberg uh, design uh, 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 that was original would be terrific. So uh, in general, I support, support it with the suggestion they try to rusticate the ramp. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so um, regarding the uh, pavilion, the Chess and Checkers house, I really um, have trouble with the use of uh, uh, partitions in front of glass, unless it's absolutely necessary. And my guess is that there might have been other ways to manipulate the elements here, the mechanical rooms, bathrooms, the, AD, the uh, unisex, and the, you know, the, the front area, such that you could have made those partitions align a little bit better and you wouldn't have to rely so much on sheetrock in, in front of glass, <coughs> especially in a building like this, which is gonna get heavy public use uh, and is, you know, is, is an outdoor, you know, indoor outdoor pavilion basically flies get in there all kinds of junk gets in there that you can't really stop and it's trapped and it, it, it winds up looking pretty nasty after a, a short period of time so I would suggest that they look at that I don't think that's in, uh, necessarily an inappropriate uh, an observation of an inappropriate condition but it's 
it's a recommendation uh, that I would suggest they consider. <laughs> the pavilion itself, the modifications to the doors, uh, et cetera, are, all seem appropriate to me. Uh, it is a, a, a peculiar amalgam of, of uh, uh, design elements and, and times that they are proposing here. Uh, but I mean, I think that could be interesting and, and peculiar. I think, I think it certainly makes the, 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 you know, the, the, the reintroduction of the rustic uh, pergola makes the uh, 1950s building look all the more peculiar. And, and kind of you know, like, what the heck, you know, who made a mistake here? But I, I think that's kind of the history of the park, but and I, that could be kind of interesting. Um, so I, I think that the, the, the uh, pergola itself is, is totally acceptable. The one thing that I, I, admit, I, I, I would just point out is the very striking reconstructed floor plan that they made of the original pergola and how the seating was so uh, thoroughgoingly congregate and kind of partitioned into rooms. And um, I found that to be a, a very striking detail. And I kind of think that, again, it's a recommendation that they consider going a little bit more into that. And, and you know, their, their seating proposal was a little bit more diffuse and open. And I think if that's deemed to be part of the character of the original pavilion. And I think it's a rather unique element that they consider uh, uh, expanding the intensity of the room-like dead end quality of the seating. Um, in terms of the ramp, <clears throat> I think that the ramp's location is acceptable except for its immediate abutment to the stair. I think that the stair was meant to be seen as an element on the hill and by exposing it both at the base and by abutting this very tall stone wall to it at the top, you remove that sense of the stair sitting on the hill. So I would suggest that they take the ramp and slide it to the north <coughs> to the greatest extent possible. They could curve it so that it misses a couple of big trees there. But um, I think that if they can get at least five feet, preferably 10 feet from the edge of the stair to the start of the ramp and to the finish of the ramp, it would restore the original intent of that stair and help bury the ramp into the landscape. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Thank you, Michael Goldblum, for mentioning the entry to the ramp. I, I agree completely. I think that that stair needs to be a grand entry on its own. Um, okay, in general, I, and also to, uh, to Diana's point, I believe that Chris mentioned that the retaining walls were going to be faced with um, bluestone. And so it is going to be rustic. Um, I will never miss an opportunity to say, will you please get rid of those hexagonal asphalt uh, pavers? Um, I know you have to do it while these things are still around. I hope that someday there's a uh, hurricane that washes them all away and we find something else to pave with. Um, hate those things. With regard to the Chess and Checkers building, I think that everything that they're proposing is appropriate. Um, I do disagree with Michael's uh, statement about the seating within the pergola. I think that, that if you, you know, perhaps it's my antisocial nature, when you close things off so that they make small rooms, then if there's one or two people in that room, you feel weird about going in there. I think the way that they've set the seating actually is going to make it more accessible to uh, everyone and, and more welcoming. Um, so I say, thank you for this. Um, you know, when, when it's time to go to the bathroom, you don't wanna go a third of a mile, you wanna to go to the shortest distance possible. And so thank you for redoing this and um, I can approve it with all of those caveats and, and things I've mentioned. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen. 
uh, I'm glad uh, Commissioner Devonshire is making some very practical advice. Uh, uh, and the reality of, uh, of modern day life. Uh, I just uh, want to echo that uh, I think some of the surfaces of the ramp that are smooth may, may want to work with the staff about alternative treatments to those uh, wall treatments. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. I think uh, all, all of my fellow commissioners have made very interesting comments. Um, I, I think the, uh, the modifications to the Chess and Checkers building look good overall. I think the, I think the applicant has uh, made it, did its line in a very, especially as it relates to the doors in a very thoughtful way. It's an oddly shaped building and unfortunately for the uses that are inside, it's very difficult to make it work very efficiently. There, there are a lot of people who are gonna be very happy to have that amenity. Um, I, I only wish there could be uh, uh, more stalls for them. Um, the pergola, I think works very well. I also think, I also like the way the seating works because you, uh, as Michael Devonshire said, it, you can be an onlooker or you can move uh, and or you and and look in, or you can sit off to the side, uh, but still be part of the entire atmosphere, which is what a park experience is all about. And uh, finally, I am completely in agreement with uh, my colleagues about the about the materiality of the ramp. I think Michael Goldblum's suggestion about possibly moving it. The entry is definitely worth investigating, um, but I think the big, big issue is really the materiality and um, and making sure that the stone in some way is irregular and natural, and certainly the stone on the retaining wall would be something to look toward as inspiration. I think the landscaping is going to, just from the renderings, is going to go a long way to incorporating it in as much as possible into a naturalistic setting. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Well, yeah, I, um, a careful and thorough, thorough thinking in design, I think. I agree with Commissioner Goldblum that the ramp has to be moved, it should not touch the stair, it should be a separate element that you move up and down. I, I think the, the, the materiality, we have to be careful with that because you, know, you don't want it to look like the, the existing podium. But I, 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 the ramp is gonna be an element in, in the park from now on, I think. They have decided that this is an element that because of the switchbacks could plant trees in between and hide it. So that makes sense to me. But I think just not touching, not touching the podium and not touching the stair makes sense. The building, I think it's it's what it's fine, worked out well. I do agree that putting sheetrock in front of the windows, which I see in a lot of parks, uh, outhouses, is just horrible, but that's that. and the um the pergola is wonderful, I think. The pergola would be a wonderful touch, uh, just a different element that gives another formal quality to this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gustafson. I, uh, I, I, I agree in particular with the, uh, with the Michaels on their comments. Um, and uh, um, again, I, I think the, the ramp is, the, is probably the only area that I, of concern for me. Um, it, it is different from the ramp at the arsenal in that the ramp at the arsenal it's the the base of the um uh of the where the, of the fencing is is always about four to five inches off the ground so um easy for landscaping to mask it um and um, i think this will always be seen so there de needs to be some finish element even if there is landscaping in front of it um, and of course i do agree that i hadn't thought of that but i do agree that uh, disconnecting it from um, the stairway is important. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Holford-Smith. I think um, 
everything's been said already. Um, I think pulling the ramp away from the stairs is an important move that will help give the stair more prominence and keep the ramp more subservient. And I agree with making the, the finish of the ramp more naturalistic. Um, I think the changes to the Chess and Checkers building are, will be an improvement. And I, I agree with uh, Michael Goldman that they can avoid putting sheetrock up against the windows that would be better in the long run for the building. And I think it's a great improvement overall. Okay. All right. So I think um, where we are, I mean, I think this is we, it's very um, welcome change. And I think that there are a lot of positive things here and we have some suggestions. So we'll make two motions um, to incorporate the f support and some of these motions. So Commissioner Chapin, can I ask you to do the motion for the binding report for the building where we will uh, make a motion to approve it and then also ask them to explore, to continue to explore with staff alternatives to the sheetrock at the windows. the feasibility yes. of alternatives. Yeah. 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 Okay. In the matter of a binding report, Borough of Manhattan, LPC 2203-831 Central Park, Kinderberg, Chess and Checkers, House Scenic Landmark. A structure built uh, circa 1952 within the Children's District in the Southern section of Central Park, an English romantic style public park designed in 1858 by Olmsted and Val. Application is to modify infill and install partitions. I recommend issuing a positive report uh, with modifications, finding that the a replacement of the existing infill will not eliminate or damage any significant uh, architectural features that the combination of the proportions, materials, profiles, details, paint finish and fenestration pattern of the proposed infill will closely recall the character of the original infill and harmonize with the building design. With the placement of the interior petitions near the glazing of windows and doors at the rear of the building will facilitate the adaptive reuse of the building while maintaining unobstructed views through the glazing in the front section of the building and that the translucent etched glazing at the side and rear facades obscuring views of bathrooms and service areas will be a discreet presence in keeping with the uh, treatment of comfort station windows within the park and will maintain the well windows characteristic sense of depth. However, I find that the uh, sheetrock uh, should be reconsidered with uh, working with the staff on. Yeah, I think that, we'll, we'll, however, we'll recommend that they continue to explore uh, the extent to which uh, the alternatives to the sheetrock to the extent possible. Thank you. Okay, great. And Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? I second. Great. And Mark, will you call the vote? Chair sure, Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Commissioner Aye. Goldblum. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, thank you. So now we'll move to the advisory report and I'll do that one. Um, all right, uh, this is docket number 2204729, Central Park, Kinderberg, Chess and Checkers House, Scenic Landmark, a plaza and landscaping surrounding a structure built circa 1952 within the children's district in the southern section of Central Park, an English romantic style public park designed in 1858 by Olmsted and Box. This is an application to replace a pergola and paving, install railings and construct a barrier free access ramp. And I recommend that we issue a positive report with modifications recommending uh, finding that the removal of the existing modern pergola and plaza paving will not eliminate or damage any significant historic structures 
that the proposed trellis, guardrails, benches, and tables at the plaza will be evocative of the historic rustic assembly, which was originally present at the site in terms of their placement design materials, details, and finishes that the proposed trellis will be compatible with the symmetrical octagonal form of the building in terms of its placement and height and will not obscure any significant views of the building or landscape vistas, that the placement of the trellis set a few feet away from the building and the paving pattern at the plaza will help create a subtle transition zone supporting the harmonious juxtaposition of the trellis assembly and the building, that the proposed alterations to the landscaping will help provide a barrier, help provide barrier free access to the plaza and the building without eliminating any significant landscape features or mature trees. That the proposed retaining walls at the ramp will be in keeping with masonry walls found in select locations throughout the park in terms of material. That the ramp will be screened by plantings, thereby helping to minimize the visibility of the paving, rectilin rectilinear footprint of the ramp, and the rectilinear footprint of the ramp from view. That the proposed plaza Sorry, the proposed paving at the plaza and ramp will be in keeping with the paving found within the park in terms of materials and finish. However, um, I find, oh, sorry, and that the installation of the proposed railings and guardrails will address safety hazards, that the railings will be simply designed and typical in terms of material finish, size, and placement, and that the stair guardrail will be simply designed with a thin mesh and painted to match the color of rail the other railings, helping it to. Uh, remain a discrete presence. And I, however, find that the uniformity, uniformly smoothly, smooth surfaces of the ramp retaining walls, um, which will be partially visible at select locations, will uh, not have the naturalistic character of the surrounding landscape, and that its proximity to the main store will diminish the, the main stair will diminish the prominence of the stair. Therefore, um, we recommend that the applicants explore alternative treatments to the walls to help them better harmonize with the surrounding naturalistic setting and that they explore relocating the ramp away from the main stair. Okay, and Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. I didn't hear you. Maybe Aye. Um, Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Did you say I? Am I having computer yes. trouble? Yeah, you're sorry. having computer aye. trouble. Okay. All right, aye. sorry. Uh, Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved. Um, well, we're issuing a positive, issuing a positive report with some recommendations that will then um, be forwarded on to the Public Design Commission. So thank you very much, um, and please continue to work with the staff. And that concludes our session for today. And I'd thank like you. to thank everyone who participated, and especially all of you commissioners. Thank you as always for your hard work. <laughs>